via uh, Zoom, so those counselors are all uh, visible on our uh, technology. I'd like to welcome them. I want to thank our broadcasting and media partners for broadcasting on and reporting on our meetings. And I will uh, take this opportunity to ask the clerk to start the meeting. Under agenda item one, I have a motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufour resolved that the minutes of regular council meeting of September 14, 2020 be approved. All in favor? Carried. Is Councillor Dufour present? He is not currently present, uh, so we'll, we'll see if he joins oh, us. Councillor Gezzo Allen is the seconder there. <clears throat> And under agenda item three, declarations of pecuniary interest, Councillor Shoemaker has uh, declared a conflict with respect to the sale of 206 Cathcart Street because the purchaser is a client of his law firm. Um, as well, he's declared with respect to A1120Z, a planning application at 1102 Fourth Line West, as the applicant is a client of his law firm. And Councillor Nero um, has declared a conflict with respect to Sioux College Engineering Degree Program EDF application as his son-in-law is employed by Sioux College. Okay, Council, do we have any other conflicts that uh, Councillors would like to declare? Seeing none, move on. I have Mr. a motion Mayor? by Councillors. Yeah, Matt, uh, yes, Councillor Hilsinger. Uh, Councillor Helsinger um, was not thinking very clearly and should have declared a conflict on the Sioux College um, application. My apologies, as I'm an employee of the college. That's no problem. Thank you. Uh, we, we will add that. So Councillor Helsinger declares a conflict on 5.4. And I think that's also at item uh, 7.3.1 of our agenda. That's noted, Councillor Helsinger. And I have a motion by Councillor Scott and Bezo Allen to resolve that the agenda for September 28, 2020 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor. Motion is carried. So Madam Clerk, that brings us to proclamations. That's correct. So I have uh, 5.1 and 5.3. I don't have 5.2. It's but coming I, down. It's coming down, but I, I have one that isn't listed. Um, I have one on uh, fire, fire Prevention Week. It doesn't look like it's on the, is it on the agenda? Um, I wasn't aware of that until just before this meeting. Okay, so are, are we reading that one also? Um, I believe they want it read because it's October 4 to 10. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> so we'll, deal, we'll start with 5.1, Franco Ontario one day. So we were happy to raise the flag again this year for Franco Ontarian Day, and that flag flew in front of City Hall. I have a proclamation here to read to recognize Franco Ontarian Day. Whereas, by virtue of the Franco Ontarian Day Act, which was legislated on April 26, 2010, it is declared that September 25th of each year be recognized as Franco Ontarian Day throughout the province of Ontario. Whereas, the Franco Ontarian Day Act 2010 recognizes the Franco Ontarians commemorate September 25th to celebrate their culture, language, and heritage and also take pride in their collective accomplishments. Whereas the Franco-Ontario Emblem Act 2001 recognizes the flag as the emblem of the Francophone community of Ontario. Of course, French is one of two official languages of Canada, and the French language has been spoken in Ontario since the 17th century. Whereas Franco-Ontarian Day has become an annual occasion to celebrate with the Franco-Ontarian community of Sault Ste. Marie. Now therefore I, Christian Province Adams, Mayor of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, hereby can put, proclaim September 25th, 2020, as Franco Ontario Day, and join the Francophone community in Sault Ste. Marie in celebrating its contributions to Ontario's growth and prosperity. So, do you have the Habitat for Humanity? Uh, Tess has just gone to get it. Okay, so we'll move down to 5.3. Whereas culture represents one of the main identity factors of the city of Sault Ste. Marie and the quality of life of its citizens. Whereas culture is an intrinsic component of both individual and societal development and cultural evolution. And whereas the cultural community has set up an annual national event, Culture Days, that consolidates a number of cultural events under a common theme, unexpected intersections across Canada by promoting access to the arts, culture, and heritage. And whereas 2020 marks the 11th anniversary of Culture Days to St. Marie. And once again, Culture Days Ontario has collaborated with the Art Gallery of Ogoma to host 
a special exhibition. And whereas the Sault Ste. Marie Public Library has a lead agency, along with the City of Sault Ste. Marie Recreation and Culture Division, the local immigration partner, our museums, art galleries, many diverse cultural groups, Algoma University and Sioux College, encourage participation with a month of virtual content and some face-to-face -face for areas in which it is safe to do so. Whereas Culture Days 2020 in Sault Ste. Marie will continue to highlight our diverse cultures, arts, and heritage within a collaborative hub called the Sault Ste. Marie Cultural Corridor. Now, therefore, I, Christian Province, and the City of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim September 25th to October 25th, 2020's Culture Days in the City of Sault Ste. Marie in the District of Algoma. So we do not have this on the agenda, Fire Prevention Week, but there is a proclamation here, so I will read it. Sault Ste. Marie Fire Service is committing to ensuring the safety and security of all those living and visiting our city. And whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and provincially, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire. And many fires that occur in the home result in major property damage and significant personal losses, and in most cases, the smoke alarm was not operational. Whereas the Sault Ste. Marie Fire Services believes that all residential fires are predictable and preventable, and our fire service personnel are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas Sault Ste. Marie's residents have proven responsive to public education measures, measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes, and residents who carefully plan and practice safe cooking are more prepared and therefore will likely be less likely to have a kitchen fire. Whereas the 2020 fire prevention theme is serve up fire safety in the kitchen, this year's theme serves to educate the public about the vital importance of effectively practicing safe cooking and to never leave cooking unattended during fire prevention week and year round. Now therefore I, Christian Province Analyst, Mayor of the City Sister, bring you to hereby proclaim and pronounce the week of October 4th to October 10th, 2020. It's fire prevention week and I urge all residents to protect their homes and families by heeding the important safety messages relayed during Fire Prevention Week 2020 and to support the many public education activities and efforts of Sault Ste. Marie Fire Services. And I think you have given me the Habitat for Humanity Declaration. I'd like to recognize Habitat for Humanity for the great work they do in our community. They've recently started another build and uh, really looks like it's gonna be very nice when it's finished. Whereas 1896, the United Nations designated the first Monday of October every year as World Habitat Day to encourage the reflection on the state of our towns and cities and the basic need of adequate shelter and to remind the world of its collective responsibility for the future of the human habitat. Whereas Habitat for Humanity Canada, founded in 1985, has grown to 56 affiliates in 10 provinces and two territories over the years. Habitat for Humanity Canada volunteers have logged more than 10 million hours, contributing to the completion of over 2,500 homes for low-income Canadians, and here in Sault Ste. Marie, contributing to the completion of 10 homes for our families. Whereas Habitat for Humanity believes in a world where everyone has a safe and decent place to live, with the help of volunteers, donors, and Habitat homeowners, local habitats like ours here in Sault Ste. Marie, and in every province and territory across Canada, help build and rebuild safe, decent and affordable homes from single-family houses to multi-unit developments. Habitat does not give away free homes. The people who partner with Habitat pay an affordable mortgage geared to their income and volunteer 500 hours with Habitat. The model of affordable home ownership bridges a gap for low-income working families by providing them with the opportunity to purchase their own home. Now therefore, I, Christian Problems, and was Mayor of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim October 5th, 2020, as World Habitat Day in the City of Sault Ste. Marie, and encourage residents to support Habitat for Humanity and learn about the importance of affordable housing. And under agenda item 5.4, the Sioux College Engineering Degree Program EDF application, Dr. Ron Common, President, and Colin Kirkwood, Vice President, Academic and Research Sioux College, are attending by Zoom. Dr. Common, welcome. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. So you, you've got the screen now, uh, Dr. Common. Colin, it's nice to see you too. Nice to see you too, thank you. Actually, we don't have control of the screen, so we won't be able to show the presentation, but Dr. Common is going to speak to it. Uh, so should, should they have control of this, the screen? Everything that we're about to cover is included in the package. Okay, so, so we, we all have it in our package. 
If you like, we can give you control of the screen, uh, Colin. Yeah, it's it would be probably better on the screen for everyone's benefit. So if you want to do that, get that organized. Okay, so you've given them control of the screen? They can share their screen. Yeah, so you should be able to share your screen now, Colin. If, uh, yeah, if, uh, if you are aware of how to do that, you can share it. If not, we can just uh, maybe use the, uh, the council. There we go. You're up. Perfect. So, If you could just confirm, you see the first slide now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have you. We're good. You're good. We're off. Good afternoon, Your Worship and Council. Uh, I'm speaking to you about our EDF application, and Vice President Kirkwood is here to answer any hard engineering questions you have. The uh, project uh, that uh, we have applied to the EDF for is, as you're aware, Sioux College and Humber. Institute of Technology are working together now to share resources and create engineering programs. In fact, our minister last Friday announced the Sioux College four-year engineering degree that we will be doing an intake for in September 2021. And we have partnered with Humber because both institutions have taught programs in mechanical and electrical for many years and uh, to create a school of engineering is the next progression of our programs. It's all about access, uh, your worship, in that now Northern Ontario students and Algoma particularly will be able to get a engineering degree without ever leaving Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, this is a major step forward for us. It is a megatronics degree program which is a combination of electrical and mechanical discipline. All four years will be taught at both the Humber campus in the GPA and the Sioux campus in Sault Ste. Marie. And the majority of the courses will be delivered by our uh, faculty with some courses broadcast from the Humber campus. The graduates will receive a bachelor's degree in engineering honors. The, uh, this program has uh, been focusing very much on the fact that we have state-of-the-art robotics programs and laboratories that can be leveraged and that's the engineering program. And it will bring significant economic benefits to the community and as uh, the details are in your package. We do know there is a strong market need. Colin, would you like to speak to the market need? We, we've been looking at labor market studies for the past year and a half, and the most recent study released by Engineers Canada is indicating that between mechanical and electrical, there will be a shortage in Canada of approximately 12 to 1500 engineers per year that without programs like this will have to be filled with immigration. The project will require the college to repurpose and renovate and construct about 8,000 square feet of program space and will include a classroom space to accommodate. It should be 100 students in total. Uh, computer, uh, the CAD lab, computer lab, and robotics lab, and project lab, advanced manufacturing lab, with about 2,500 of it being renovation and 5,500 being rebuilt. It will involve, uh, uh, once we've uh, implemented it, approximately 12 to 15 high paying jobs at Sioux College, professors, lab instructors, program support staff through the operation of the program uh, will generate a seven per year uh, based on the full time program uh, enrollment, which will be injected in the local economy, and 33 direct and indirect construction jobs over the design and build phase. And the next steps are that we've made a, uh, where it will cost $4 million, this project, and will be funded through a combination of Sioux College funds, provincial funds, federal funds. We've made applications to Fed, Norton, and 
NOHFC. And we're hoping that uh, we'll be successful with our EDF application to the city for $100,000. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. Colin, appreciate your presentation. Council, we have uh, the presentation. We also have a staff report from Mr. Ver. Mr. Ver is present. Uh, Mr. Ver, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so we have uh, we have obviously the college uh, that can hear us, and we can ask any questions we have of uh, president of the college or Dr. Common, or sorry, Dr. Common or Doc, or uh, Colin, and we also have Mr. Ver on the line. So I'll start with uh, Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Question to Mr. Common or to Colin regarding the 75 students. Out of the 75 students, how many will be in the suit? Just curious. Our, our, our plan is to have 40 students studying the program. Oh, sorry, let me, let me do that again. Our plan is to have 40 students in the first year. And once the program has run for three years, have roughly 100 students. All in, in, all, in all four years. Sorry, the, 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 the end of that uh, answer was a bit unclear. So the plan is to have 40 students in the first year, and then after the first year when you're up and running, all the students uh, are, did you say all the students are from Sault Ste. Marie? So every year that goes by, we'll add one more year to the program. So in the first year, we'll have year one running, second year, year one and two, and year yeah, one. Yeah. After but the question is, are are they all students at Sioux College or will they be split up at Humber? Oh the, the one hundred we're expecting to have here on our Sioux College campus. Humber is planning to have approximately sixty students in the same program in the GPA campus. And uh, my Second follow-up question would be, you said 12 to 15 high-paying jobs in the zoo. Um, those are professors, teachers, et cetera? I think the answer was that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Councilor Gardy. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. My name is more of a, more of a comment and um, you know, platforms and electronics provide a framework for trans transdisciplinary learning. Um, they often encourage creativity and they assist with increasing productivity. I did a little reading about electronics over the weekend and everything I read talked about intelligent systems and services and products that they develop. And to me, it's an excellent opportunity for our community to continue its path towards a more knowledge-based economy. I don't think um, that there's a better example of a pursuit in our community at this time um, than that of Sioux College's uh, engineering degree program and its future uh, plans to develop that out. So I will uh, strongly be uh, supportive of this uh, application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Councillor Bezuel. Thank you, um, Mayor, through you to um, either Dr. Common or um, Mr. Kirkwood. The $4 million budget um, at this point is not secured. If you're not successful in provincial or federal funding, um, do you have a plan B in terms of funding this expansion? We, we cannot comment. We have... Uh, how should, how should I put this? Uh, we we have uh, we're very optimistic about the uh, the uh, funding application, and we expect there'll be official announcement. Also, in terms of the physical space, it's going to take about eight thousand square feet to accommodate the labs and classrooms. Is that going to involve another um, building um, having to be constructed, or are you going to be repurposing existing space at the college? I, I can field that question. We actually repurpose existing space at the college. 
Yeah, so as I understood it, the, the question is the 8,000 square feet, what I understood from the presentation is 5,500 is going to be renovated and 2,500 is new. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Common? That's correct. No other questions. Okay. Uh, Did you want to add to that? Yes, can I just add that, that the design is in progress right now and it's not finalized, whether we're repurposing or adding some space to the college. We're, we're still working on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Councilor, Councilor Dufour. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first off, I'd like to echo uh, my fellow Councillor Gardy's comments uh, about this School of Engineering. I think it's an excellent addition to the community, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, it, it receives widespread support and is part of our community for a long time. Um, my question for Dr. Common is also um, centered around uh, the question of physical space. Um, it says that some of it might be repurposed and renovated. And so my question is, um, is the college examining the uh, former uh, space occupied by the daycare in order to repurpose and renovate for this program? No, not at all. Great. Um, and as a follow-up question, maybe more for uh, Mr. Bear. Um, what guarantees does the city have that this funding will remain with uh, the School of Engineering for an extended period of time? Um, if the city's investing uh, the CDF money, do we have assurances that the School of Engineering will continue to be offered for, you know, at least a five, ten year horizon? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Dufour, um, certainly within the um, application uh, process and the project period, the costs that the college submits um, are monitored and um, can only be applied towards the project submitted. Um, to your point about the longevity of the program, uh, that's something we can um, look at within our agreement with the Sioux College um, as we provide our, um, if council approves, as we provide the contract for the agreement. Thank you very much, Mr. Bear. I would definitely, uh, I think that would be a, a wise move on the part of the city to ensure that uh, this funding stays for its intended purpose for a long time. Thanks very much. So I don't, I don't see any questions in the chamber. Looking to our vir virtual friends, uh, I don't see any there. So, look, I, uh, Councillor. Okay. So we'll go with Councilor Christian and then Councilor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do have just a comment. And uh, first of all, I wanna congratulate uh, Mr. Kirkwood and Dr. Common. Uh, having been a past member of the Sioux College Board, I know that they strive to provide programs where they see opportunities in the marketplace and more importantly, a need in the marketplace. And this is clearly an example of that. Uh, I, I know that uh, there's some obvious benefits in the short term should this program get underway with uh, increased students, employment opportunities, but I think just as important is the fact that we're going to be providing uh, education and opportunity in fields that we need in the future. And as Councillor Gardy pointed out, there um, there. Uh, um, jobs that uh, that a lot of young people want to come back to the Sioux for. So hopefully, and I'm confident that the program will provide uh, new graduates um, not only op job opportunities, but but to fill employment opportunities in Sioux Saint Marie, which we badly need. So congratulations to all. Thank you, Councilor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was also just a comment. Um, Pretty much everything that and uh, Councilor Christian have said. I know that there's a lot of hard work that's been put on behind the scenes for this. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank everyone involved, uh, be it everybody at Sioux College or Humber or even provincially or federally. So uh, I think it's good work and, and it is something that we want to see in the Sioux and, and bring people back. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to pour more heaps of compliments on it and thank everyone for the hard work. And hopefully we get to see this coming up relatively soon. Okay, so we have heard from everybody who wanted the opportunity to speak to it. 
I will just reiterate all of the positive support comments uh, from my colleagues. I want to thank Dr. Common and Colin. I want to thank you both for your time today. I also want to thank you for putting this package together. We're happy to uh, support it and participate in it, and we certainly wish uh, you all the best with this, uh, this project. It's a good project for our community and a good project for the college, and we thank you for it. So did, uh, Madam Clerk, have you read the resolution? Do we I have not yet. Okay, go ahead. I have a motion by Councillors Gardy and Bezel Allen resolved that the report of the Deputy CAO, Community Development and Enterprise Services, dated September 28, 2020, concerning Sioux College Engineering Degree Program EDF application be received, and that the investment of $100,000 to Sioux College from the Economic Development Fund to support the establishment of an engineering degree program in Sault Ste. Marie be approved. All in favor? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. That brings us to 5.5. Um, I thought 5.5 we were going to do after planning. Are we, are we going to leave that one to after planning? Okay, so we're going to go to 5.6 then. New budget management and capital budget policies. And Shelly Shell, I believe, is on the line. Uh, one second, uh, Ms. Shell, before, before you do your presentation, I just wanted to give Councillor Vezel Allen, as the finance chair, an opportunity to make a comment on a, a finance matter uh, that she asked to make a comment on at the beginning of the meeting. Go ahead, Councillor Vezel Allen. Thank you. I just want to let everyone know that the budget input process is live. I really want to thank uh, Tessa Vecchio and Jordan Allard in marketing for really assisting finance in our new virtual intake for this uh, virtual town hall. So right now, if you go to suestmarie.ca forward slash budget 2021, you can um, get all the updates there. You're also welcome to email budget input at cityssm.on.ca. You can call 705-759-5350 to have your budget input. You can also fax at 705-759-8447. And you can also uh, drop us uh, an old-fashioned letter and stamp if that works for you as well. Um, and you can just put it, address it to budget input to 99 Foster Drive, P6A 5X6. And also look for updates on our Twitter and Facebook social media. And we really encourage our community to give us input. That's something that I know my colleagues and I really um, appreciate taking the time. And we need to know what's important for you. So again, I want to thank marketing for helping us uh, with this because we weren't able to do the town hall like we had uh, planned. So thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, Shelley, I appreciate uh, your patience there. If you could uh, begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, just a brief presentation to summarize some of the new uh, financial policies that would be coming forward. Next slide, please. The Finance Department has been actively updating and instituting various uh, policies to ensure it assists the city in its endeavors to build for the future while maintaining affordable service to its taxpayers. Financial policies provide guidelines for financial decision making and are central to a strategic long term approach to financial management. The Government Fi Finance Officers Association provides that formal written policies adopted by governments institutionalize good financial management practices, clarify strategic intent for financial management, define boundaries support good bond ratings, promote long-term strategic thinking, manage risk to financial condition, and comply with established public management best practices. Recent policies uh, previously approved by council include the surplus policy, reserve and reserve fund policy, and the investment policy. The two new policies, the debt management and the capital budget and financing policy are being presented tonight for council approval. Next slide. Debt management has a direct link to the capital and operating budgets. The capital budget contains the effect of the projects on future debt levels and the debt service requirement. 
whereas the operating budget makes a provision for all the amounts required to service the annual principal and interest payments due each year. Thus, borrowing decisions made in the current year for the capital budget will impact future operating budgets for the term of the debt. The key recommendations of the policy include external debt should be a minimum of $1 million and should have a minimum term of 10 years, but not to exceed the useful life of the asset. It is also recommended that debt should not account for more than 60% of total project costs so as to provide long-term flexibility. Total debt servicing, uh, we've set a limit of 5% of own source revenues. And just as a reference point, 2019 was 1.4%. It also uh, includes internal debt, which is utilized uh, city reserve funds, uh, provides a less expensive method to finance smaller capital projects. So the recommendations for internal debt is that it shouldn't exceed $5 million and the maximum term shouldn't be more than 10 years. Total internal debt is limited to 40% of uncommitted reserves so that the purpose of the reserve and the associated requirements are not impeded. You will also see that tax room from retired debt will be directed to the asset management reserve and it will provide a source for renewal, rehabilitation and or replacement of aging infrastructure. It also allows us for future allocations for debt servicing. Pay as you go is going to be continued uh, for ongoing rehabilitation of regular and or um, ongoing capital expenditures. Example there is our capital wor works, uh, roadworks projects as well as our rolling stock. Next slide, please. The capital budget and financing policy provides the framework for capital budget and financing in order to ensure capital investments and are budgeted and maintained consistently and financed in a man manner to ensure a funding mix which prioritizes long-term financial sustainability. The current capital budget and prioritization processes are formalized in the policy. You'll also see uh, a few new recommendations and they include that the CFO may recommend for approval to the CAO to reallocate funds from one approved project to another up to $75,000, where an increase to the approved amount is needed. As well, you'll see provisions for a capital budget carry forward included. So projects uh, that are in process greater than three years will be subject, subject to a review to close out unless carry forward is approved by the CAO. As well, capital from current uh, projects uh, must be scheduled for completion within the budget year in which they are approved and carry forward will be approved by the CAO only in extenuating circumstances. That concludes the summary. Um, next slide, please. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them at this time. Okay, we do have some. We're gonna start with Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Ms. Shell. Um, Shell, you said that when debt is retired, it'll be reallocated to the asset management uh, reserve. But what if we want to use retired debt to pay for new construction? Like I'm thinking in the case of the John Rhodes, as that gets paid off, I think it was scheduled to be paid off this year or next, whatever the case might be. Um, we were going to you know, allocate that money to the construction of the, of the new twin pad. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, this is under the assumption that the debt is not repurposed. Um, it's for the timing in between. So when that debt is uh, finished, the servicing costs will put to the asset management reserve, and then council can approve to use that servicing either for future capital projects or uh, for future debt. Okay, so we've got the discretion to, to allocate it elsewhere. It's not automatic. Correct, it's just to preserve that debt servicing within the levy. Okay, good, thank you. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, we have Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you, uh, to you, Mayor, to you, Michelle. Um, on page four of your presentation, I believe under capital budget carry forward comments, um, you have a bullet point that talks about um, projects and process grades in three years will be subject to a review to close out unless further carry forward and approved by the CAO. Um, so if I understand that correctly, um, first question is, would we as council first receive a list of any capital projects that might be in this situation? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth. Um, 
that could become part of the capital budget presentation that we do um, to council each year. There is formal reporting that you will see within the policy that sets uh, various items out and that uh, it uh, can be included as well. Okay, just how it's worded, it sounds like, you know, it may just never come back to us. Second question with that. So it sounds like you're saying that um, each year you would have a chance to glance at this list and maybe influence. And the last question, I guess, is um, if it's just coming down to expiry where our CAO is going to say yes or no, we as council would hopefully have a chance to influence to say, please um, look at continue on this project for these reasons. So we'll have an opportunity, obviously, to influence this, correct? Great. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, Council will be receiving reports twice a year on the status of any um, capital project that is in process. So anything that is approaching that three-year mark, you will be advised of at that time, and you can provide your comments and recommendations. Okay, that makes me feel better, so we could um, okay, have a final word. Thank you. That's all. Okay, I have Councillor Christian next. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> to uh, CFO Shell. Just a quick question. Uh, one of my questions was already answered. Under the external debt, uh, it says a minimum of 10 years. The, the loan would be a minimum of 10 years. What's the purpose of that? Is it simply to spread out the servicing charges and minimizing the effect on the levy? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Christian. The purpose for the minimum is that uh, any debt that is probably taking less than 10 years to service will likely be able to be accommodated within our internal debt. But keep in mind, these are all recommendations that we're going to be working within. If there's an exception, uh, council has the, well, it'll be brought to council or council can also make a recommendation elsewise. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Dufour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, under the same bullet point, Michelle, um, it talks about the other limit for external debt being uh, should not account for more than 60% of total project cost. Can you just explain some of the logic behind that number? And does that number include internal debt as well? Through Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, uh, that number relates only to the external debt. And the reason being is that we want to provide flexibility. As I stated in my presentation, borrowing decisions that are made in the current year are going to influence operating budgets into uh, future years for the term of the debt. So I did look at benchmarks for other municipalities. Most were lower, um, usually about 30%. But a lot of those municipalities have growth. They have stronger reserves that they can utilize as well. So hence why the 60%. Because as I stated to Councillor Christian, this is a recommendation and a guideline that we're going to be following. Um, as things progress, uh, there may be reasons why Council may see fit to um, approve something higher than the 60%. Okay, and so hypothetically, what would make up the uh, other 40% of the project were we to use external debt for 60%? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, it would be either through reserves or through uh, government grants and other possible user fees that may be implemented to assist in a project. Okay, so under this policy, would it be possible to use external debt for 60% of a project and then to use internal debt to a maximum of $5 million, regardless of what that did to the external debt percentage? Just so I'm understanding this correctly. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Dufour, no, there are two distinct pools of money and the internal debt, its whole purpose is for smaller capital projects, not to um, um, stack on with external debt. Okay, good. so we would never be 100% financing uh, any project under this policy then? Under this policy, it's not recommended, but as I stated, a council always has the right to approve something outside of the policy. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's the real important point to focus on. The policies are, are good to have as, as a structure and as a guideline, but ultimately council decides in the end uh, what decision it's going to make. And if council wants to do something that might be inconsistent with the policy, it, future councils would be able to do that. 
I have no one left on my list. Looking to the virtual world, I see nobody with their hands up. And looking to the real one in front of me, I see nobody else with their hands up. So we could uh, move on from this. This this actually needs to be approved. Did you read the resolution, Madam Clerk? The resolution would be passed with the consent motion. Gotcha. Okay. So it's in consent. Can we then move on to the consent agenda? I think that's where we've got 20 minutes before planning. Okay, so we're going to move on to consent. Councillors in the room, Council Gardy, you were the first with your hand up. What matters do you have? Excuse me, 6.7 to begin, Mr. Mayor, please. Okay. Which is the Innovation Center uh, upload. The <clears throat> I don't know if Mr. Lanning's on the line or if I could direct this to Mr. Bear, but um, you know, I think it's important we support this initiative. Um, I was just hoping that Mr. Lanning could please provide us with some background for the public uh, about the Innovation Center's up north in the venture. Do we have uh, Brent on the line? Brent, are you available? Yes, uh, and it's, was that Mr. Gardy that was speaking? That was Councillor Gardy, yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. To you, Councillor Gardy, yes, a bit of perspective on this. Uh, Innovation Center approached the city on potential areas uh, where we could house uh, this program for uh, the Up North, North Foods program, helping local uh, uh, areas here in Sault Ste. Marie. So we explored a number of uh, alternatives here at our locations. And the best one we came up with was the Northern Community Center, which had ample area to house uh, the program during the day in collaboration with sharing the space with the senior center. So that was the best alternative for daytime parking and use of the space. And they agreed to uh, make a payment uh, to use the space on a monthly basis. Thanks, and it is through you, Mr. Mayor, again, Mr. Uh, Lamy, is it going to be something Monday to Friday, uh, essentially, or a couple of few days a week? Just, just person curious. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, yes, Monday to Friday. Thanks. Okay, so anybody else on 6.7? Nobody else on 6.7? Do you have anything else, Councillor Gardy? Uh, I think I have one more here. Yes, I have 6.9, um, more of a more of a statement. Uh, I'll be glad to support the, get the flag gallery extension, um, and I hope uh, we have to continue. We have the opportunity to continue to expand it for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, every flag we raise on that gallery on the drive up to City Hall. Uh, makes the newcomers feel included and valued, and if they feel included and valued, they feel welcome. So um, I think it's a great thing when we we uh, need to uh, expand that gallery to uh, recognize um, people from all over the world who are coming to settle and bring so much to our community. Thank you. Okay, um, that's staying on consent, is it not, Madam Clerk? Or you? Uh, Councillor Shoemaker had asked for 6.9 to be separated from. Okay. Okay, so, so we, we are going to separate 6.9. On that note, uh, before we go any further, we're and going to se separate 6.9. Councillor Christian wants to separate 6.12. 6.12, and Councillor Dufour uh, just sent me a note, and he wants to separate 6.11. So 6.9, 6.11, and 6.12 are all going to be pulled from consent. So we'll deal with those separately. So Councillor Gardy, those were your matters. We'll get to 6.9 uh, later. Okay, any, anybody else? Councillor Hollingsworth, go ahead. Thank you. Um, item is 6.6, 6, um, which is the parking by law enforcement. Yep, go ahead. Um, through you, Mayor, to Ms. Gilani, I believe. Go ahead. Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, in your basically report, you mentioned, I believe, uh, to permit a more proactive enforcement approach. Uh, there was a comment in your report, uh, Mr. Lannan, correct? And so just wondering if you can expand, what do you mean by to permit a more proactive enforcement approach? Are you going to be looking at giving um, Norco or whoever we use a little bit more authority to give out um, new tickets? I mean, right now it's for parking, but are you looking in the future of expanding um, their, their authorization to give out tickets for something else, like maybe speeding through Adobe Park, as an example, or? Can you just comment? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth. Yeah, you're right on uh, the track there. What uh, we had done last time was, with respect to parking, was that it had to be uh, routed through police and or direct. So this provides them a little bit more of an incentive, uh, or not incentive, but 
to be more proactive in issuing the tickets as opposed to having just inbound calls where there was a concern noted uh, at last council when this came forward that there might be too many tickets uh, issued up front. So through the pilot, uh, we're fairly comfortable in working with public works, police services and legal that we're in a good spot to have a bit more of a proactive approach. And then we'll see what the statistics look like and bring them back uh, at the end of next year and then move forward from there. Okay, thank you. I think this is very positive um, for many reasons. So I look forward to um, seeing the outcome, the successes in the future. Thank you. Councillor Bruni, are you on 6.7 also? 6.6 uh, also? 6.6, yes. And Mr. Lanning, uh, review, review, reviewing your stats, I noticed the stats are, are down. Um, so I guess the question is, it, is Norco do, doing their job properly or do you need some uh, fine adjusting or tuning? Hey, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Bruni, yes, we're satisfied with the performance of NORPRO. There was a couple of factors this year that came into play. Uh, one was the initial communication of having calls, the having to get relayed from police services. Uh, we had an educational process where now the public can call police services or NORPRO directly, so it provides two opportunities. Uh, we also had the impacts of COVID, which uh, had led to more people working from home. And uh, we believe they're doing a great job. And I know that. Uh, Public Works uh, has also stated that uh, there's been lots of situations, I believe it was 100 hours at least, and Susan Hampton Beach is on the line to speak to this, that it saved uh, numerous uh, hours in them having to uh, address situations. Thank you. Anybody else on 6.6? Okay, seeing none. Councilor Hollingsworth, do you have any other matters on consent? Go ahead. Just one more. Go ahead. Um, item is 6.1, Physician uh, Recruitment. Uh, for you, Mayor, um, to I guess Mr. Uh, White, it's more of a comment. I just want to, once again, um, to outline um, and thank um, the group for um, working very hard on the physician recruitment. Um, when you talk to patients and you talk to different community members, we do see a noticeable positive impact. Um, and um, I can't really comment on specifics except that I do see that more specialists are coming to our community. Um, there's more young family doctors coming to our community. And I do want to give one really good example. Um, recently, um, a close friend of mine, um, personal family member, passed away. And this particular person went on and on to say that two young family physicians were absolutely incredible. And they went to the Northern Ontario Medical School, and they recently came to see St. Rachel's practice. And um, this person was absolutely, absolutely delighted on the professionalism, the care they received, and unfortunately, the person passed away. But even after, um, they reached out to the family to see if they're still doing well. So, as a positive, um, I continue to support this. And um, I just hope and um, see that this is going to continue to grow and attract more uh, physicians to a wonderful community. So um, again, um, I just think it's such a positive piece for, and I know that our communities have looked at our model as well. So thank you. And please pass it on to um, the groups that are involved here. On 6.1, Councilor Nero, and then you too, Councilor Vezuel. Okay, so Councilor Nero, then Councilor Vezuel on 6.1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. White. Mr. White, under the analysis, the paragraph under analysis, uh, the sentence that reads that uh, PRC is investigating further revenue sources as the funding covers base operations only and does not address recruitment and retention activities. So, so does that mean if they don't, bring, if the if the committee doesn't find other funds that we're not doing any recruitment or retention? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, who uh, <coughs> comes for uh, Nero. It doesn't uh, mean that per se. Uh, we do have uh, physician uh, recruitment staff, and uh, there are day-to-day uh, -day operational activities that they are, are always doing to link in with uh, prospective physicians and to uh, attract them to the community. Uh, <coughs> 
what that phrase is talking about is, in addition to that, at times during the past when we've had physician recruitment activities, we have offered specific incentive packages to physicians. This is something that the committee has discussed over time. It's become less important in attracting physicians to our community, but it's also an area that was funded entirely from our reserve, which is now depleted. That's why I note that while council approved $50,000 in levy funding towards the operating activities last year, we'll also approach you with a further $40,000 ask at the upcoming budget to get our contribution totally on the levy. The committee does recognize that potentially in the future, new either recruitment incentives or other types of recruitment and retention activities may be needed. So they are looking at finding other sources of funding to meet those needs. I don't know, I should point out that Councillor Hilsinger is chairing the physician recruitment committee at this time, and she may wish to add something to that. I don't have anything to add, Malcolm. I think you covered that fine. Thank you. So the takeaway is incentive packages were there. We really don't know if we need them anymore, but we're still going to look at them in the future. Yeah. So I was involved in this until recently, so I can speak to the history of it. We're doing physician recruitment on an ongoing basis, and the operating contribution we make is physician recruitment, right? So if we have staff that are doing physician recruitment, they're incredible staff, and they connect with the doctors, they connect with the residents, and they connect with our stakeholders to determine what we need to attract to our community. On top of those efforts, there are different incentives that different communities offer to different specialists, or that changes from time to time, right? And it changes within your own community as to what you might want to attract or what you might need to attract, and what's the market offering to attract those doctors. What we understand is over time, the incentives have become less important than other factors, like quality of life and the professional opportunities. So we don't have the same kind of standard incentive programs that we had before, but there might be from time to time we have to look at offering incentives to fill a need or to compete in a competitive market where other communities are offering cash incentives. So they're looking at all of that now, and they're considering that on a going forward basis. But we had reserves that were funded historically that we would draw from to support physician recruitment and to support the incentives. That's depleted now. So this past year, we put part of the physician recruitment into our levy, and they're going to be coming this year to put another part into the levy so that we can continue offering the service, which I think across the community everybody recognizes is incredibly important, and we play an important role in convening it and working with the stakeholders to make sure that we stay organized and stay competitive in the marketplace to recruit doctors. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I completely support the committee and the work that it's done over the years and continues to do. That clarification is necessary. We're missing an integral part of the committee's work, and should we be more proactive in trying to find these funds? Yeah, so it's a very diligent group, and I thank Councillor Hilsinger for her activity and participation in it. They will be coming to us if they need additional resources for those activities, and the ask will be there if they do need those, but they're still working through that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Councillor Vezina. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. White. The $65,000 and $65,000 from both two area hospital and group health center, is that cash or is that in kind or a combination of both? That's cash. Cash. That is cash. And the office is housed within the two area hospital facility. And is there a charge that physician recruitment pays to two area hospitals for the office space? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Vezina, I'm not that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. And my only other question, and it could be to Councillor Hilsinger, are there regular reports in terms of measuring outcomes 
in terms of the recruitment process. Like we have, you know, five potential positions, you know, that are considering coming, and out of that five, one, you know, are we, are you keeping statistics on on that recruitment process? Uh, uh, Councillor Vazowalan, yes, there are significant uh, statistics that are kept and records that are kept. Everything from the number of physicians who were reached out to, the number that actually that they were successful in recruiting, the costs going all the way back to uh, I feel like the year 2000, give or take, or maybe slightly after that in terms of everything that was spent, how much it cost per physician in each year to recruit. The records are very extensive and very helpful in, in measuring. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. Anybody else on this uh, matter? See none. Those are the extent of your matters, Councillor Hollingsworth. Any other matters of consent? Council, Council do four. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just on this point four, and I'm not sure who to direct this question to, but uh, in the report, uh, it states that Public Works has applied for the grant funding from SVM, but a decision cannot be secured within the required time frame. I was just wondering for a little clarification, does that mean we were unsuccessful in our grant application, or that staff had a particular reason to hire this consultant sooner rather than later? For you, Mr. Mayor, to have to do for, may I ask, our, the, um, the funding application and the process has advised us that we will not be given word of the findings probably until next fall. Uh, and unfortunately, based on the timing, uh, that did not seem reasonable. We, we know we're behind uh, as it is. So we would be hopeful that would be, perhaps we would be at a, another phase in this project and be able to apply at a later date and go through the process once again. Okay, just missed the end of that. Um, is, is the indication that we would be able to apply for uh, additional funding from this program at a later date? We're going to have the CEO through you, Mr. Mayor, to talk to uh, our As uh, Ms. Hamilton reported, the decision point for funding for the first phase would not match up with our needs. We do need to get this on the way. It also was something that we did uh, find the budget for fully ourselves. It was a program that come after we had brought it to uh, council. What she mentioned there is the uh, we'd be able to tap into this funding for future phases of our fleet management. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else on the same matter? Councillor Shoemaker, then Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Ms. Hamilton Beach. Um, Susan, can you confirm that the 116,000 that uh, the company, uh, the successful company uh, quoted is in uh, Canadian dollars? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, yes, it is in fact Canadian dollars. Okay, thank you. That's my only question. Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to step back on, on, on this uh, item uh, through you to Ms. Hamilton Beach. The fleet management service is a mandated service, correct? We're required to, to partake in this? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Christian. Uh, as public works, we understood we were mandated to do so by council through the last budgetary process. So uh, part and parcel with our request for additional capital funds was the completion of this study. Okay, and so the, the purpose of this, uh, just to refresh my memory, and I'm sure, sure part of some of council, the purpose of this service is to do what again, specifically? Through you, Mr. Mayor and Council Christian, we'd be looking at a comprehensive review and evaluation of our entire fleet process. Uh, so looking at our, our policies, our procedures, and our practices, as well as all the organizational structure that's involved with this, our staffing, our facility, and making sure that our fleet is in fact right sized for the services we provide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anybody else on this agenda item? Mr. Mayor, sorry, I realize you came to me already, if I may. Just Councillor Christian reminded me of it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, Ms. Hamilton Beach, uh, the council passed a resolution, it was back in February, I think, asking that our fleet uh, to the greatest degree possible, uh, or, or that we receive a report on electrification of our fleet rather than uh, gas powering our fleet. So could this be something that is considered as part and parcel of the fleet review for PW? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Shoemaker, yes, that is in fact a component of this study and we look to have as green as possible solution to our needs. Okay, thank you. Councilor Dufour, do you have any other matters on the consent and debt that we haven't separated? No. Council, any other matters on the consent agenda? I uh, do want to draw attention. Any, anybody on the virtual world with matters on the consent agenda? I do want to draw attention to uh, 6.2, 2020 City of Sault Ste. Marie credit rating. I just want to thank staff for their good work. Uh, I didn't see a lot of, of carry of this story kind of carrying on, on social media and whatnot. I think it's a very good news story. You know, when when the pandemic started, you know, there were a lot of very <clears throat> credible and important questions about what are you doing and how you're going to respond to it. Um, and then there's the ongoing matter of having to be responsible on an annual basis with our budgeting and our financial controls. And I think we can all take a lot of comfort uh, if you read through the, the report uh, from the, the agency that our staff is doing a very good job taking care of the city's finances. And I want to recognize our staff for that. I think there were a lot of positives to take out of this report. And I think it shows that uh, from an administrative perspective, uh, outside of the different things we did through responding to COVID, uh, we did a, a solid job for the community in looking at our own finances and managing them properly. And then on an ongoing basis, we have you know professionals here that are doing a good job and will continue to do that. So I wanted to thank uh, the CAO and uh, the team here, the team in finance and the team across the corporation for uh, being as responsible as they have been with this, the city's finances. And I wanna just draw specific attention to that report. So thank you uh, to Malcolm and the team here. So with that noted, Madam Clerk, with the exception of 6.9, 6.11, and 6.12, I think we can deal with the consent agenda and move on to planning. I have a motion by Councillor Scott and Dufour resolve that all the items listed under date September 28, 2020, agenda item 6, consent agenda, save and accept agenda items 6.9, 6.11, and 6.12 be approved as recommended. All in favor. Motion is carried. That brings us to planning. And application under agenda item 7.7.1, application 8102 Z, 62 Sherbrooke Drive, RJ Holdings Incorporated. Uh, motion by Councillor Sardigan Bezal Allen resolved that the report of the senior planner dated September 28, 2020, concerning rezoning application 81027 be received, and that Council rezone the portion of the subject property that is currently zoned medium density residential zone R4 to low density residential zone R3. The portion of the subject property currently zoned environmental management shall remain as such, and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect the same. And Mark Lepore, as a solicitor for the applicant, is on the line. Yeah, we also have Mr. McConnell with us. Mr. McConnell, before we go to Mr. Lepore for the applicant, I'd like to ask you to give a, a precise of the application to our viewers. Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor. This property is part of the not yet constructed portion of Sherbrooke subdivision on the east side of People's Road. The application is a little bit different from most applications that council deals with. This is a rezoning to downzone the property from medium density residential to uh, low density residential to permit the creation of four single detached lots. Uh, it is recommended for approval. And as the clerk mentioned, Mr. Lepore is on the line on behalf of the applicants. Thank you very much, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Laporta, do you want to speak to the application on behalf of the applicant? Uh, Council, I have uh, nothing to add of ways to permit the development of four single family residential lots. If there are any questions, I would be happy to. Very well. Do we have anybody, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, on the line that wanted to speak in opposition to the application? So we have no one that's registered to speak in opposition to the application. Do we have anybody else registered to speak in favor of the application? 
Council, do you have any questions for either uh, city staff or the applicant's legal counsel? Seeing none, we'll have a vote on the matter. All in favor? The application is approved. Thank you for your time tonight, Mr. Lepore. Thank you. Okay. So that brings us to 7.7.2, Madam Clerk. It does. That's application A1120Z, 1102 Fourth Line West, Avery Construction. And Councilor Shoemaker has declared a conflict on uh, this as, his, as the applicant is a client of his law firm. There's a motion by Councilor Scott and Dufour resolved that the report of the senior planner dated September 28, 2020 concerning rezoning application A1120Z be received and that under the provisions of Section 36 of the Planning Act, Council remove the holding provision upon the subject property and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect the same. Okay, so Don, we're going to start with you again. Mr. McConnell, if you can please give us a precis of the application. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. This property is located near the intersection of Fourth Line West and Allen Side Road. Uh, it's a request to remove the holding provision on the existing REX or Rural Aggregate Zone. Uh, and that would allow for an expansion of the existing Bar X Ranch. There will be no new access points located uh, as a result of this. The existing Bar X, sorry, Bar X Pit access point will remain. Uh, the application is being recommended for approval. It should be noted that uh, following council's approval, assuming council does approve this application, uh, the applicant will still have to apply to the MNR for a pit license in order to expand the existing pit. And I see that Mr. McDonald uh, is on the line tonight as uh, on behalf of the applicants. Okay. Mr. McDonald, would you like to speak to the application on behalf of the applicants? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, I will be brief. Um, one important uh, note that I wish to kind of convey is that uh, this isn't a uh, pit expansion per se, this is actually uh, an application for a new license. Um, the, uh, the application is subject to the stringent controls of the Aggregate Resources uh, uh, Act. And as such, we are following that process uh, as we speak. And this is one of the uh, steps in approval for an MNRF permit. Okay. So, uh, Council, we're going to go to you now. You have the, the uh, well, before we do, uh, maybe we should check with the, the Deputy Clerk. Is there anybody registered to speak in opposition of the application? So no one else is registered to speak to this application tonight. Okay, so you have the applicant here uh, uh, to answer questions through their engineer, and you also have city staff. So we'll, we'll take questions from Council now, Councillor Hollingsworth, and then Councillor Gardy. Thank you, uh, to you, Mayor, to, um, I guess, the applicant's um, engineer, Mr. John McConnell, I think. Just to clarify, did you say that tonight we are going, is the application for a new or renewal license? So it's to renew the license, or is it to allow the area to be expanded for this business for the gravel and pit and so forth? Can you just clarify what you just mentioned? Uh, you uh, go ahead. Um, thank you, Councillor Hollingsworth. Um, I'm not sure if I actually heard that very clear. You were a little garbled, but uh, to clarify, um, this is for removal of the holding provision on the zoning. It is already zoned uh, REX or aggregate extraction. Um, in order to proceed to the next step and for um, one of the approval boxes per se for the MNRF. Uh, license is the re removal of this holding provision. Okay, so I just want to understand. So I apologize, but I thought you were saying earlier that uh, it could be an application to renew their license. But uh, to Mr. McDonald, this is actually just to um, basically approve their rezoning. Is that correct, correct Mr. Donald? Uh, so this is for a new pit. This is not uh, for a renewal. This is for a new uh, pit license uh, through the MNRF. What's in front of uh, the city tonight is for the removal of the holding provision 
on an already property zone piece of property. We're not the licensor in this. Okay. Yeah, we have a we have a holding condition on the zoning, but it That's is zoned for this. That's why I thought it sound different from how you first described it. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and then my um, one last um, question is again to clarify: this still has to go to the Ministry of Natural Resources, who technically could um, reject it or could um, further ask questions. So it still will go back in the hands of the MNR. Is that correct, um, Mr. John McDonald? Through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct. Um, the MNRF has a uh, rigorous um, licensing process uh, with public consultation, uh, numerous technical studies which get vetted and reviewed, um, among other among other things. And that uh, that application is before the MNRF currently. And for us to proceed to the public consultation phase, this is one of the steps uh, we have to complete to get there. Okay, and actually one last question. Uh, thank you uh, for you, Mayor, to Mr. John McDonald. Um, do you know if um, this is going to be increasing jobs uh, for this company and obviously potentially for our community? Do you know, can you comment on that? Do you know? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hongsworth. Uh, I have uh, uh, another owner's representative with me, uh, Mr. Brent Avery, he's beside me. Perhaps uh, he'd be better off to speak to that. Uh, the new, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councillor, the new um, license we're seeking will, uh, it may add some um, jobs at our uh, company, but for the most part, it'll be just more of a continuation of what we're already doing. Okay, thank you. Um, my comment is that this is going to potentially help your business and which is a positive impact for the community. Thank you. Okay, I just want to let Councillor Christian know that I have seen him so he can put his hand down, but we're going to go to Councillor Gardy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. McConnell, if you could just, uh, for the benefit of the public, explain real quickly what precisely a holding provision is. I think that would be, you, you pretty much have, but could you just reiterate uh, what a holding provision is for us, please? Uh, certainly, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, every piece of property in the city is zoned something. This property is zoned a Rural Aggregate Extraction, or REX, which means that it is zoned uh, for a gravel pit. Uh, as part of that zoning, when the council approved the new bylaw back in 2005, we put a holding provision on. The reason for a holding provision is to review, uh, we're not changing the use, the use of the future use of this land will be for a gravel pit, but it's to provide a review of a particular condition. And in this case, the review is for groundwater protection. The concern being that this is in the city's aquifer, uh, as is basically all of the gravel pits in town. And we wanted to ensure that, that there's nothing that occurs on the site that would potentially contaminate the city's aquifer. Uh, as part of their application, uh, they did file a documentation and a report on that, as well as a stormwater management plan, indicating that there would be nothing uh, done on this property that would pose a threat to the city's aquifer. Hence, the recommendation from staff is to approve the request to remove the holding category. Right, through you, Mr. Mayor, and Mr. McConnell. So, so not only so they have to they have to provide you know to, by way of an engineering firm that you know these these criteria are met correct mr mayor could you repeat the question we are having difficulty hearing questions from from council tonight well it was it was essentially the same question he had just asked you like they have to establish through an engineering firm that uh they they will not have that effect on the aquifer that's correct and the um MNRF licensing provisions will enforce that. Right. So through you, Mr. Mayor, the concerns about the impact of the development in, on groundwater uh, were outlined by a couple of, of residents who contacted me. I know they they spoke to uh, Mr. McConnell and or Mr. Chinazzo. Um, they are outlined in a uh, letter that is in our package. Um, they have two, two main concerns. 
So could you please outline some of the policies that were included in the city's official plan in 2005 that aimed at mitigating potential contamination by such a development? Would you be able to outline a few of those for us? Um, certainly through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy. Uh, our existing official plan prohibits fuel storage or fuel handling on this property. And there will be no fuel storage or fuel handling on this property. We also prohibit chemical storage and handling. Uh, we prohibit vehicle maintenance repair. Uh, we require that the applicants have a spill management plan in place in case there is a problem. And we also require the applicants to have a stormwater management plan in place. All of those items have been complied with. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, all of that will be sent over to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry uh, for their consideration on including those conditions in the pit license, uh, which they do enforce very rigorously. Thank you. And one final, one final question um, following up on concerns raised by uh, a couple of families. They also expressed in their letter concerns regarding, um, you know, any damage to the structural, uh, to, to the structures of their homes. Through what public engineering does, and or the ministry, or anybody, or, or any other agency, is is there any way that people who are who are in close proximity um, to such developments could be protected from any type of damage should it occur in this development or not? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, uh, those items will be taken into consideration uh, as part of the pit license review. Um, they do, they are going to have to meet all the MN RF requirements uh, with regards to that. And I think that that would be a, a reasonable form for the neighbors to pursue. I express their concerns there because the design of the site I know takes those items into consideration. Mr. McDonald may have some additional comments on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCall. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, as part of the application processes, we actually uh, have completed a noise assessment, a uh, vibration assessment for any operations on the site, uh, two separate and distinct uh, environmental assessments, looking at the natural environment, a hydrogeological uh, assessment, looking at impacts to any sort of groundwater, and an archeological assessment. Uh, I may have missed one, you have to excuse me, I, I wasn't prepared to speak to those other um, studies, but uh, the MNRF Aggregate Resources Act um, and pit licensing process is very rigorous. And uh, these, uh, these type of items are addressed through that process. Thank you, and Mr. McConnell and Mr. McDonald have both mentioned there will be an opportunity for a public forum in the lead up uh, to this. So I encourage any residents with uh, concerns to express those uh, directly at that forum. Thanks so much for your time, John. So we have Councillor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, Councillor Gardy did ask a question regarding the letter that two residents uh, brought forward. I was just going to ask if Mr. McConnell has spoken to them. Uh, uh, I have not spoke uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni. I've not spoken to, to you directly, but uh, Mr. Tanazo in my office has spoken to both of them several times. Okay. Okay, we'll go with Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Gardy asked a few questions that I had. Uh, I guess a question to any of the gentlemen. Uh, are the ministry requirements uh, different for new pits versus existing pits? Have they, have they changed their requirements in any way? I think that's a question that perhaps Mr. McDonald would be better able to answer. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, the Aggregate Resource Act has changed through the years. It has been updated. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, I don't know when the last update was, but um, it has, like any sort of act, has evolved through the years to address new issues as things have arise. Uh, in addition to uh, the Agri-Resources Act, as does call upon 
uh, other legislation um, like the Environmental Protection Act, um, things of those nature, which keep it current to ensure that the protection of the public, environment, et cetera, st still adhere to. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. McConnell. Since we've uh, implemented our own changes here a while back, have we had any incidences with uh, pits in the city in relation to the aquifer? Have we had any critical issues? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Christian, uh, no. The short answer is no. And we have since put a Source Water Protection Act into place, which is very rigid, but it is also more restrictive, uh, or more limited, I should say, with regards to the areas under consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, during this process, uh, is the is the Public Utility Commission, is the PUC brought into this at all since they're responsible for delivery of water? I would seem to me that they would play some role, whether it's consultative or just the very least just informed of what's happening. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, the PUC is advised of all development applications that the city receives and they're given an opportunity to comment. They were very involved in both the uh, creation of the original uh, zoning and official plan conditions, uh, as well as the new Source Water Protection Act. So they're very much informed as to the situation. Okay, thank you. One final question. Perhaps I could direct this to our legal department. In the event that something were to happen if we were to approve this and something were to happen is the city itself liable for the aquifer specifically uh so i think that question should be answered by mr mcconnell mr mcconnell did you hear the question yes i did um and Mr. Mayor, if I may, I just want to back up a little bit to Councillor Christian's previous question. Uh, I did check our, our, uh, our report here uh, and the PUC were circulated for comments and they had no objections to this. Uh, if, uh, if something were to happen, would we, we be legally liable for that? Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe that's a legal question, but I, 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 I don't know the details of that, but I do know that by uh, uh, other zonings that the city has done over the year, I do not believe that makes us le legally liable for anything, but that should be directed to our, our, um, our legal department. I've okay. never, I, let me put it this way, I've never had a legal action back against the city for any decision that we have made on a zoning matter before. Uh, true enough, uh, I would, uh, from a layman's point of view, A, the ministry is approving this and sets the guidelines, so, I would think that it would minimize the, the city's exposure. And to your point about, uh, you know, possible legal action, th this one is, you know, I don't suspect we'll have a problem, but, you know, if there was something negative, it would be, it would be, you know, rather, it could be rather substantial. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Councilor Dufour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question has to do with um, some of what's discussed in the report here about stationary equipment, fuel chemical storage, and handling and vehicle maintenance. I understand from the report that uh, due to the expansion uh, of the pit, none of these activities are permitted to take place in the expanded area. Uh, and I believe we're to assume that these activities will take place under uh, the existing pit license and the facility is there. Uh, is that all correct, Mr. McCall? That's, a, that's our understanding. That's correct, Councilor Dufour. Okay, so my question is, uh, will the expansion of this pit uh, increase the amount of, of vehicle maintenance and storage at the existing site? And is the existing site up to the standards that are outlined in our bylaw for spill contamination, uh, protection of stormwater runoff, et cetera? Um, Mr. Mayor, I believe Mr. McDonald or Mr. Avery would be better able to uh, answer the yeah. questions with regards to expansion. Yeah, I think the, the, the first part of that question should be directed towards them and then maybe you can add a comment to the the last part about bylaw compliance. So we'll go to Mr. McDonald and Mr. Avery here. 
Did you hear the question? Yeah, I believe I've, I believe I'm, I'm thinking in the right lines here. The materials for this pit, it is to, that's what it is. It's a production and supply of materials. It's not necessarily creating more jobs or activity. It is for the continued operations and supply of materials for the company, for the business. Yeah, but I think what Council Dufour is getting at is it's an expansion of your, your current operation there, right? So like you're, you're going to have more pit. So will that lead to an increase in activity there, vehicular activity or maintenance activity on those vehicles? And is the infrastructure you have there now adequate to deal with any increase that might result from the expansion of the pit? It might very well be that the expansion, it might very well be that the expansion of the pit won't lead to any increased activity because you're just going to be doing the same amount of, of excavation just in a different area. But I think that's what he's looking to get some clarity on. Yes, and that's exactly it, Mr. Mayor. That's exactly what it will be. There's not really going to be any increase. It's just as one area depletes, we move to another. So that's, that's really all it is. So the, the infrastructure that you currently have there is sufficient to continue to support your operations. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and does the infrastructure that is currently there comply with uh, the, the stormwater management requirements as outlined uh, in the bylaw and in our report here? So we'll, we'll direct that to Mr. McConnell because the, the council is asking about bylaw compliance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, the, um, the information that we've been provided indicates that they do currently uh, comply with all existing legislation as well as all manufacturers' requirements for uh, storing materials on site and handling materials on site. And again, that would be a requirement and enforced through the pit license, through the provincial pit license. And that situation will remain. Okay, and so uh, my understanding would then be that uh, a physical inspection uh, would occur on that existing property as part of the expanded pet license. And I, I see Mr. McDonald's hand up. Go ahead, Mr. McDonald. Yeah, just to uh, hopefully clarify everybody, there is annual ins inspections undertaken yeah, by the Ministry of Natural Resources sector. Okay, thank you very much. That's great to know. That's all my questions. Councillor Bezo Allen. Thank you for you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. McConnell. And Mr. McConnell, I just want to um, bring up and ask a few questions about the email from the Sault Ste. Marie Conservation Authority. So we're fully aware that the pit license has to be approved by MNRF. That's been very clear. I want to speak to and ask about what requirements are um, the Conservation Authority look, looking at, especially in terms of the email saying that um, it is located in an area under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Authority with regard to Ontario Registry 17606 development. Um, any development on the subject property will require a permit by Sault Ste. Marie Conservation Authority under Ontario Registration 176-06. Can you further elaborate on the oversight as well with the Conservation Authority on this project? Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Vezo Allen. The Conservation Authority has jurisdiction and requires permits on uh, a kind of a, a, actually a large area of Sault Ste. Marie, generally on slope lands. Uh, their concern uh, focuses on stormwater management, as is the city's. They're also very concerned with regards to erosion and making sure we don't make flood potential areas worse. Um, this is a very standard practice for them. Anyone who's gone through a development on a ravine or on a slope land somewhere has had a permit. Uh, again, it is a requirement of the Conservation Authority, but they're not going to be looking at water quantity and water quality to the extent that MNR, M, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry will be. It is a requirement they're going to have to meet it, but I would not see it as a major obstacle. Thank you very much. Council, do we have any more questions on this matter? Councillor Hollingsworth? Do we make comments? Nope. No. So are we, we uh, have any more questions on the matter? 
Okay, all in favor, the motion's been read, all in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you very much for your time tonight, gentlemen. You, you've got your approval here from City Council. You've got a process to go through with the provincial government, so uh, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are, we're gonna clean up the rest of consent, Mr. CEO, before we get into the presentation on the plaza, if we should. I think that's agreeable to you. We'll go to 6.9 then. Agenda item 6.9. Flag Gallery expansion. Um, there's a motion on the on the as it appears on the consent agenda by Councillor Starty and due for a result that the report of the Deputy CAO Community Development and Enterprise Services dated September 28, 2020, concerning the request to add seven flags to the Flag Gallery on Foster Drive in recognition of our First Nations communities and contributions made to this community by newcomers as part of an ongoing commitment to acknowledge and celebrate Sault Ste. Marie's vibrant cultural diversity. The refer to the 2021 supplementary budget is as it appears on the agenda. And um, then from Councillor Shoemaker, seconded by Councillor Dufour, to change that to, um, and that the expense associated with the installation of the new flag poles and the raising of the new flags be paid through the 2020 uncommitted capital fund as opposed to the 2021 supplementary budget. So uh, before we go to Councillor Shoemaker, Councillor Shoemaker, I'll let you speak on this, but just to give everybody a quick synopsis, uh, the agenda came out and I think there was a, a broad consensus amongst Council that you wanted to move ahead with this and Councillor Shoemaker had suggested you know, as opposed to referring to budget, just finding the resources in the current budget. So staff have worked with uh, Council Shoemaker on the wording of this, and it will just, you know, allocate the resources from uncommitted so council staff can have the permit, get the permission tonight essentially to move ahead, and they'll make the arrangements they need to make uh, to get these flag poles up, and then we'll get the flags up. And I think it's, I think as, as Councilor Gardy said at the beginning of this, it's a real positive initiative. I, I, I love driving up and through uh, the flag gallery, and I, I think it's a real, symbol for our community and I think uh, you know it's a real action that makes people feel welcome and at home so I'm, I'm glad to support it and I, I think it's fantastic that we are going to see uh, Batchewana First Nation and Garden River First Nation flags fly there too. So Councillor Shoemaker did you want to speak to uh, to it before we vote on it? Just uh, to say uh, Mr. Mayor that uh, yeah obviously I thought that it it was something worthy of funding um, now rather than the budget and you know getting around to it next year potentially uh, as it gets ranked with um, with uh, uh, other items that were that we're trying to balance at budget time and and it was a pretty small uh, amount that was required and so I thought we could uh, you know fund it this year through the existing budget okay. so all in favor motion is carried now that brings us to 6.11 uh, council D4 you wanted to pull this so I'm going to have the clerk the resolution and then I'll, I'll go to you. A motion by Councillor Scott and Dufour resolved that the report of the Director of Engineering dated September 28, 2020 regarding 2021 capital transportation program be received and that procurement proceed for design of 2021 projects and that the resurfacing of Trunk Road and Black Road between South Market and the Rail Crossing be the designated project for the City's application for the 2021 Connecting Lakes program. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Dufour. Um, okay, uh, I, I don't necessarily have uh, questions for staff. I've, I've, I've gone back and, and read all of the relevant uh, EAs and transportation studies. Um, what I'd like to do is to move to uh, amend the capital transportation program list for 2021 to 2023 to uh, remove the Sackville extension entirely. Um, I believe that this would have the uh, the effect of, of moving up the McDonald Avenue uh, stormwater project into 2021 and clearing uh, a lot of space for other deferred items uh, in 2023. Okay. Is there a seconder for that motion, Council Vezuela? So, Council, just to be clear, we're not debating the main motion. This is an amendment to it to remove a specific project. So, this is what we'll be discussing now, and then we'll vote on this amendment. 
And then if this amendment passes, you'd vote on the, the, the motion as amended. So on this amendment, so uh, did go go ahead, Council D4. Okay, uh, so I, I was just gonna make a yeah, couple yeah, comments. Yeah, yeah, we're still with you. That's okay. Um, so the, my, my reasoning behind it, um, <clears throat> quite frankly, is I, I don't believe that we should be building uh, new roads while we have such a significant uh, list of, of existing roads and infrastructure on our deferred list that, that, that are not being done. I think we need to take care of what we have before we start building new. Uh, furthermore, on review of the EA, which I understand uh, will expire as a consequence of this decision, um, within uh, uh, Tullock's report on the EA, they indicate that um, the conditions of uh, congestion on Great Northern would not actually be improved until we also extended the scopes of driving road to meet the DeSacto extension. Um, you know, at, at that point, we've spent <clears throat> well over uh, $8 million, and I believe that uh, public is much <clears throat> sorry, better served um, by, by fixing the roads that we do have. I, I, I look to next year, and we only have a couple of neighborhood streets that. Uh, that will be done in 2023, and by, by allocating these resources into our neighborhoods, I, I believe that we're going to be uh, making uh, the right decision by our, our constituents. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Nero. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three good to, uh, I guess, Councillor before. I just, I think he just clarified this, but. Is it the intention to remove uh, 2021, the early works on the ravine, and also in 2023, the actual construction of third line? Is my correct mention? You're asking to be the Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the implication of removing the uh, ravine works would, uh, for the EA to, the EA would then expire because the ravine works wouldn't be able to be done until 2022 and they wouldn't be able to settle in time for the final uh, reconstruction to happen in 2023. Um, so the implication that I see here is that um, we would be able to get some stormwater projects done earlier next year, and in 2023 we would create a significant amount of space for other items on the deferred list uh, to be completed within the scope of, of this current five-year capital transportation program. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, in effect, approval of your amendment would be sending a message to staff to not bring back or renew the EA at all, unless yes. Council of the Day decides to go ahead with it. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Mr. And, any further, Council Nero? No, thank you. Councilor Hollingsworth. Thank you, uh, you Mayor. To uh, Mr. Don Elliott, if hypothetically this is passed, um, can you please explain, um, when you talk about the EA expiring, can you please explain um, if in the future a council would like to bring this back to the table, what would the process be? Um, and again, just reiterate the expiry date. And then when you talk about the process, can you talk about how much money has been spent so far on the EA? and potentially future expenses. Um, and lastly, can you also touch base on um, advantages of this SACO and versus disadvantages? Maybe give two to three examples for each, please. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, Hollingsworth, the, uh, the Sackville Road extension is a result of an EA done uh, almost 10 years ago, obviously, for. Uh, a number of things. One was the capacity of uh, congestion on Great Northern Road. The, also the big factor here was the uh, relocation of the hospital. The hospital relocated from the waterfront to the north end of town. So that required several things, uh, not the least of which was the third line extension that we completed several years ago. And this, uh, this extension of Sackville also uh, will provide uh, more traffic circulation in, in that area. Another thing I would add is the, the city has only one north-south access between Black Road and People's Road uh, to get between second and third line. Great Northern Road is, is uh, 
almost equidistant between Block Road and People's Road. And it, uh, this is a very, a very large portion of the city is not accessible north-south, apart from a circuitous little route that goes through uh, Foxborough Trail. Uh, that's really the impetus of, uh, of this project. So it's been on the books for many, many years. As far as the amount of money that's been spent to date, the, I believe the EA was well into six figures, probably the low 100,000 uh, and change. We've also completed the design and uh, so the project is ready, was uh, ready to tender because it was canceled a few, a few year, years ago by this council. So we're just uh, bringing it back at this time. It's, a, it's a, a vehicle connection. It'll be also be an active transportation connection. Uh, there is no active transportation connection between uh, Great Northern Road and People's Road. So those are why it's many of the reasons why we think this is uh, a worthy project. We respect the EA process also. That's uh, it's the outcome of the EA process. I respect council's uh, authority to choose do nothing. They, they can do that. Uh, I will add one more thing, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm not sure how this, we're doing an environmental assessment now. Uh, we're just starting one for traffic circulation in the Great Northern Road second line area with some additional possible additional roads and accesses. That EA presumes that uh, the Sackville Road extension is, is in place. So I don't, I'm not sure the ramifications of, to this new EA, if that uh, environmental assessment goes ahead with a, a direction not to uh, complete the Sackville Road extension. I think that kind of summarizes, I hope that answers Councillor Hollingsworth's questions. I've rambled a bit. Well, the new AA, presumably, the new AA that you're starting, if, if this decision is made tonight and council decides not to move ahead with Sackville at this time, the new AA you're undertaking would have that information and would take that into consideration as it, as it went through its process, would it not? Uh, I, Mr. Mayor, I expect it would, uh, especially if this EA expires. Uh, if this EA expires, then the new AA, EA takes over, it, also, it would be addressing the congestion problem on, on Great Northern Road. It might expand the new EA. So I, I, I wouldn't say that this takes Sackville Road completely off the table, but it would add it back in, in the mix for this, uh, this new environmental assessment that we're conducting now. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you have any other questions? Just one more. Um, thank you, Mr. Elliott. That was a very good summary. Um, I don't think you rambled. I thought it was quite educational. Um, just to clarify um, to Councillor um, Dufour, so if I understand correctly, if we take Sackville extension off, what are you seeing um, with that, that money? What are, you're going to want to apply that money towards the McDonald's um, Piece, and is there anything else you would hope to apply that money to? Um, do you have some other areas of concern that you would hope that we as council would look at for other um, road maintenance and so forth? Uh, so for 2021, that's correct, Councillor Hollingsworth. For 2023, I believe a larger chunk of funding becomes available, which um, my presumption would be uh, we would be able to complete uh, some of the projects that were deferred from this five-year cycle, which then include um, Cray Street and, uh, and Hartman Street, which I believe are, are the two board ones that on the list there. So those would be able to be uh, presumably more deeply slated in, uh, along with others in 2023. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and um, I do have a comment from both the other um, streets, but not to do with Sackville. Will we have a chance to comment on the rest of the list? Because uh, this is resolution. We're just talking about the amendment right now. So I'll keep those comments and questions. When we get back to the main, 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 main motion. Uh, Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I do agree with Councilor Dufour regarding the Sackville Road uh, extension. I believe at this time, um, the Sackville extension and to Mr. Elliott, the approximate cost will be $7.4 million. Am I correct on that? Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni, it's, uh, we set aside a million and a half in this budget and then 23, uh, 5.9. The uh, 
So the total would be, yes, close to uh, over seven, 7.4. If we put that 7.4 to uh, to resurfacing and, and reconstruction of our roadways and maybe some storm water improvements, uh, would that give give us a, a good dent into some of our issues that we have around town? Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, Bruni, yes, obviously, if that money is redirected, there's many projects that would benefit from it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Councilor Gardy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And if I missed this in the report or any comments thus far, forgive me. And I'm not sure who to go to with the institutional memory on this one, but in 2000, in 2005, um, was that in 2000, when was it initially kind of uh, pushed back? Was it 2005 or was it 2011, 12? No, we, we pushed it back during the last council term. I, I think I, I think I was the cool. probably the instigator of that then. Okay. Um, through you, Mr. <coughs> through you to thank you. Through you to Mr. Elliot. I mis I probably misunderstood your comments. In two thousand five is when this project first kind of came to light as going to alleviate some of what was then uh, a busy Great Northern Road and anticip anticipated to be a much busier uh, Great Northern Road. Is that correct? 2005? Mr. Mayor to Councillor Gardy, I'm not sure if I mentioned 2005, I, it might have been an error. The EA was completed in 2011. It was probably a two or three year process. Uh, but again, this project. This project has been on the books for many, many years. Certainly, all my time here, there's been uh, there's been a desire to push Sackville through to meet Third Line and the connection that we did uh, through the ravine on Third Line to connect uh, People's Road across to Great Northern Road. Thank you. Now, I, you know, I had some conversations with councillors with councillor Ben uh, to be transparent about you know the move to come forward. And I see where Councillor Newport and Councillor Bedwell are, are, are going with this. But as I listen to staff comments and I, you know, go over what's before us, I also appreciate that, you know, not only we do have to take care of our existing communities and our infrastructure, I appreciate the, the piece of stormwater management that we've been in and around McDonald Avenue. Um, but I'm also kind of torn because. If you've ever been up Great Northern Road in the last few years, between certain times, I think uh, you'd appreciate why staff is recommending that we have another corridor that runs north south. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of at odds, and though I have made up my mind, I'm kind of heading towards the other way right now because of what I see as you know we want to grow our community. Our community has grown. A lot of it commercially has grown to the north end of the community, and a lot of our residential neighborhoods have moved to the north end of the community. And I don't see how we can encourage future development in the community when we don't have the necessary infrastructure to support it. And the piece about the hospital is an important one. Right? I think Mr. Mr. Elliott referenced how with the development of the hospital, that corridor of Great Northern Road leading north and south to it is, is often very congested. So um, yeah, so I, I appreciate where Mr. Dupour is coming from. Um, I also understand staff's recommendation. But we can't lose sight of the fact that um, yeah, it's just the busiest part of our community, and we may necessarily have to do something in the, in the very near future to, to address it. And I thought this is obviously the first step in that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, one more question to Mr. Elliott. Is there any other opportunity besides the fact of an extension to alleviate any of the traffic that runs north and south on Great Northern Road? Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Councillor Gardy. The environmental assessment essentially answered that very question. Do we extend North Street? Do we extend Sackville Road? Do we make Great Northern Road seven lanes? Um, 
we're kind of restricted on the east side. We can't push Pine Street through because of the irregular nature of Old Garden River Road and the residential uh, uh, subdivisions that are there. So the EA essentially, the EA process determined that the extension of Sackville Road was the preferred alternative uh, for all of the reasons that are delineated in that in that uh, in the environmental study report. Thank you. Hey, Councilor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Mr. Elliott, you mentioned, um, or I don't know if you mentioned it or Councilor Dufour mentioned it, but the current environmental assessment going uh, being undertaken on Great Northern Road and Second Line uh, and how it is contingent on the assumption that Sackville goes through. Would it make more sense to bring Sackville forward at that time when that EA is complete? Um, because as Councillor Dufour, I think, noted in his comments, without those connections to Industrial Park, um, I don't think that, that the EA or the traffic report on Sackville extension noted there was going to be a huge improvement until those connections were made, which I think uh, are being undertaken in, in the current EA. Am I right about that? There was a lot in that question, but. Mr. Mayor to Councilor Shoemaker, uh, the way I've uh, sort of divided the two issues up is this. Sackville Road addressed the north-south connection between second and third line and the, the congestion uh, traffic uh, on Great Northern Road. This new environmental assessment is more about traffic circulation and property access to the big box area, uh, possible connection from, from industrial park down to second line, uh, possible connection from industrial park over to the new Sackville and possible things on the east side, uh, on the Walmart side. And for that matter, also on the south side, a possible connection to, um, I suppose, Willow. So that's what this environmental assess, the new environmental assessment is about property access and circulation of traffic in that area. The, the original EA from 10 years ago was more about access north, south and uh, provision of, of uh, better traffic alternatives to get to the hospital. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, that is. Um... But I, I guess the question remains, does it make sense, does it make the most sense to do them together? From an Mr. ease of traffic to, uh, flow perspective. Mr. Mayor to, to Councillor uh, Shoemaker, I suppose uh, in our view, uh, this has been on the books for so long, and it's the, again the EA recommended it. We would we have been we've had it in the in the five year capital plan for for quite a few years now. We would like to proceed with it, but to answer your question, uh, the capital expenditure in that area of Sackville and a few other smaller projects, smaller road extensions, would be uh, it'd be a significant project up there, uh, but it. It doesn't have to be done now. It can be done. It can be done later. There's. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that it's. It has to be done this year and in 2023. Okay. And what's it take to uh, do an addendum to the EA to to revive it? What, what kind of time frame are we looking at for that and cost? Uh, uh, EAs these days are so difficult to to estimate, Councilor Shoemaker. The, uh, it depends on the feedback you get from, from uh, residences. Clearly, there's a lot of work already done in the CA. If you had to redo it or do an addendum to it because of the time expiry, there's, there's work that's already done that's, that's still valid. But you have uh, part two order requests to deal with and that kind of thing. They're, it's very difficult to say how long it would take. EAs take at least a year sometimes too. And if, there's a, if it's a sticky one with respect to a part two order requests, they can take many, many years. Okay, and this, so so the addend, uh, I think you could, is it an addendum to the EA? Is that what it's called when you renew it? Yes, in this case, if, if this job was deferred, there would be an addendum to the environmental assessment if we uh, wanted to proceed with Sackville. We have to okay. revisit it. Okay, so the addendum is, is just, I mean, it's starting over, except you have the benefit of the previous work done. 
Am I understanding that right? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, on shifting gears there a little bit, if this is removed from the capital planning um, uh, five year uh, estimates or whatever you've put in there, um, does is you know is it uh, open to council is that that we put projects forward to fill that vacancy? The void left by the removal project. Perhaps that's to you, Mr. Mayor. Well, certainly there there is a prioritization you know at your disposal already, and I think things staff would have to look at the the space that's freed up and the prioritization they have and bring us back the recommendation on how to proceed. Uh, but again, as I said earlier in the meeting, it's always at council's direction. So if councillors, you know, had some uh, some uh, changes they'd like to see with that, and they were successful in convincing a majority of their fellow councillors those changes should be made, then they could be. But staff does have a, a list of projects that they have prioritized. This is one of them. And if we take it off the list, they would they would I would believe reorganize that list. But I'll have to give the CEO an opportunity to speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I guess Councillor Dufour initially, I wasn't sure exactly about your amendment. Was your amendment looking just to remove the backfill project from 2021 and 2023? You also suggested in your amendment that uh, the McDonald's uh, stormwater management one be moved from 2022 to 2021. Um, yeah, it was to. Uh, to remove the Sackville extension. Um, as the mayor clearly pointed out, staff's prioritization uh, list is in front of us. And as I was looking at the list for 2022, uh, equivalent financial sense to move up what the McDonald's has been so far. So is that part of your amendment? Uh, yes. Yeah. So just so there's clarity then, and as the CEO is pointing out, the, the, the Council of is looking to amend the motion uh, to answer Council Shoemaker's question, not just to remove the Sackville project, but then to be sure that what takes its place is the McDonald Storm Water Management Project, which is on the list already. And uh, you're looking to move that into its place. Yeah, just for 2021. And then in 2023, there would be uh, a significant amount of money freed up you're by that implication or other items that are on staff's deferred list. So the, to my point, Mr. CEO, you would, uh, the staff would bring back recommendations on the 2023 uh, itemization. That's correct. Okay. Is everybody clear on that and how that amendment's working? Okay. Councillor Vezuel. Sorry, Councillor Shoemaker, were you finished? Was that your last point? Yeah, just uh, the, you cleared it up there. Uh, so, I mean, I guess if we wanted a project inserted in 2023, if this is successfully removed, then uh, we'd, we'd bring a motion to that effect. Yeah, I think staff will be would, would bring the prioritization to council and then you would be able to at council make adjustments if you saw if council saw fit. No. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Bezuelan. Thank you, um, to you, um, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Elliott, and this is to address um, some of Councillor Gardy's concerns in terms of congestion on Great Northern Road, and I, I certainly agree with you. We, we know that there's congestion on Great Northern Road, and Councillor Dufour and I certainly are saying that there is, and that there needs to be a solution. So the EA um, is 10 years old for the Sackville extension, and that focus of them was really on because that is a residential and somewhat commercial area, and I get better access to the Sioux Area Hospital site. Is that correct, Mr. Elliott? Uh, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Vesuel, I'm not sure I get the gist of the question, but uh, in our view, more traffic circulation around Great Northern Road improves access and gives options for traffic to get to the hospital. It's in the same, that's in the same, the same reason we've uh, completed the environmental assessment for the Black Road third line corridor. The other job that you see on uh, council the seat or on the uh, 2021 program this evening is third line. That's the result of an EA for, uh, for the traffic flow on the east, uh, to the east side of the hospital. So these, 
these two things sort of tie together. But it doesn't particularly address, from my understanding, if you're taking a look at traffic flow, say in terms from McDonald Avenue through Pam onto Great Northern and on up. So it doesn't concern with any of the congestion like McDeckley Nav Corridor, Great Northern Road going going north. Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, Vezo Allen, this environmental assessment was uh, essentially looking at the traffic flow on Great Northern Road between second and third lines, not farther south. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Elliott. I would add, Mr. Mayor, uh, the Pine Street extension to second line, that was something that assisted with the Great Northern Road block between uh, Northern Avenue and second line. That was a separate environmental assessment. Okay, so we're still on the amendment. I've given everybody who had a, wanted an opportunity to speak to the amendment, the opportunity to speak to it. I don't have any other hands on the amendment. Uh, before we vote on the amendment, I, I will just make a few comments myself. Uh, we had this discussion in 2017. I feel the same way now about it as I do then. Uh, we recognize there is congestion on Great Northern Road. I would suggest, you know, at specific times of day on specific days of the week, there, there are a number of times you can go up to the hospital where there is really isn't much traffic at all. Um, and although that is uh, an area we need to, to find some solutions for, I would be of the stronger opinion that we have other needs that are more dominant. And this is a really big spend uh, where we could be improving our, our active transportation and traffic infrastructure significantly in other ways uh, if we focused on those priorities. So I don't feel any differently today than I do in 2017 about the, the nature of the priority in our rankings and would support Councillor Dufour's amendment. Councillor Bruni? I just have a question to, for Mr. Elliott regarding the environmental study. And I just want to bring up an example regarding the Ward 4 Elliott environmental study, um, which is in process right now. But I'm looking at this uh, capital transportation program. I don't see it on the list. So when the, uh, the environmental study comes back, council votes and say votes in favor, does it just slot in somewhere, Mr. Elliott, or is it pushed back to 2025, 2026, et cetera, et cetera. I guess it's just a question regarding. Mr. Mayor, to, Mr. Mayor to Council Bruni, uh, because the EA is, an EA is in process now, we have no idea what the size of capital expenditure there will be at the end of this environmental assessment. Once we know we have a budget figure for what is going to be required out there, then yes, we, could, we, we would fit it into the five-year plan uh, somewhere. The five-year plan is fairly uh, dynamic. Sometimes you get a grant uh, for a project that frees up other money that you've put in the five-year plan. So there are uh, some opportunities. Sometimes there's carryover funds from the previous year for low tender values. So it's not, uh, it's not unlikely that we would fit it in uh, in fairly short order after, it, uh, after the EA is complete. So in the meantime, and, and I know I'm a little bit off topic, but well, yeah, we got to get back on topic, though, Councillor Bruni, because we've they, got we've got a presentation waiting for us too. So very well, but okay. So I just want the residents to understand that once this environmental study comes back, Mr. Elliott says it might take 2025, 2026, et cetera, et cetera. So okay, fair enough. Yeah, if we take it off the books now, it's not clear when it will go back on the books. It could take it could take a while. No, no, I'm not talking about that, Mr. Mayor. I'm talking about the environmental study for the Elliott area. Where does it fit in here in the capital transportation program? That's my question. Mr. Elliott did answer. So. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so just on, on we're sorry, that was really off topic. We're just on the amended part of this motion. So, Councilor Nero, is that what you want to speak to here? Yeah. Okay. And it's a question wasn't put as a comment, but um, if we approve the amendment, 
We're also approving moving the McDonald Avenue to 2021. That's correct. But we're not changing our policy as far as the management of these projects for my staff for subsequent years. Are we going to go back to what we used to do and let staff know what we should be doing in those years? Or are we well, going to well, just make this this year because it makes sense because we're not approving? We're not changing any policy. You're doing, okay. you're, we're not changing any policy. So that's my concern. I really don't want to change the policy. We're not. Um, you're doing two things. You're removing that project and you're identifying which project will take its place for 2021. Yeah, and, and on the same token, then, if we're going to remove that project, I think that, I think if I go around this table, I think I'm going to get some people that would agree to this, is that, uh, and I think you referred to it as well, our priorities have changed over the last number of years, especially in stormwater management. And we are, Councilor Bruni just talked about the EA for People's Road. There's probably going to be a couple more coming up. Lower Wilson is experiencing the same problems with flooding. Uh, Lower North Street is experiencing the same problems. And it's just a matter of time. It's not just a matter of time, it's just a matter of money. We haven't brought forward these EAs all at once. But these problems are not going away. It's not the one in 100 year storm anymore. It's every year that these people are getting flooded. So that's why I can uh, agree to the amendment. Mm -hmm. But I think at the same time, we have to send the message that the storm water management has to be really taken into consideration in looking at the money from 2023 and how we use that. And again, I don't want to use that by saying this is the project we should do in any given year. We should leave that up to staff as we normally do. But I, I wanted to get that message out. Thank you. Okay, so we're all clear on the uh, amendment that you're voting on now? On, on what, Councillor Hollingsworth? On, on the amendment. Okay, this, is, this will be the last one and then we're going to vote on the amendment because everybody's had a chance to speak to the amendment already. I can appreciate that, but we're voting on something serious to impact the whole city. Um, I appreciate the amendment, I really do. Um, the old piece that I'm struggling with is um, the McDonald's portion because there's so many other um, critical areas, um, aqueducts, which also impact flooding and so forth. So I wish the amendment would say, um, let's take that bill off and let that come back with an up-to-date list. And I appreciate the flooding, but we have flooding in so many other areas too. So, so I don't have to vote against it because I think that there's other priorities that need to be addressed. Okay, thank you. So uh, we will have a vote on the amendment now. All in favor of the amendment? Shall, shall I read it first? Have you read? Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, it's a motion by Councillors Dufour and Bezoal Allen resolved that Sackville Road extension be removed from the Capital Transportation Program 2021 Early Works and 2023 and that McDonald Avenue Stormwater Management be moved from 2022 to 2021. Okay, all in favour? At home, all in favour? Councillor Hilsinger, I didn't see... Uh, okay, opposed? Okay, the motion, the amendment carries. So now we're on the main motion. So, Council, so you have the, the main motion as amended. Uh, you had some questions about the, uh, the items in the report that don't relate to Sackville. Well, now would be the time to ask those. If, if we're seeing none, we can vote on the main motion as amended. Councillor Hilsinger. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm really excited to see that this is called a transportation plan, not a roads budget anymore. I think it's more reflective of the direction that we're all working together to take the community in. I'm wondering though, um, in the section in the report that talks about active transportation, uh, we're referring to projects that have already been planned in the past and are, and are being completed. 
And I'm hoping that every year we're going to be making continued investments in active transportation for our community. And if we don't have any plans for future, then we need to be making some. So um, um, perhaps um, Mr. McConnell, you could comment on what from your perspective is happening in active transportation um, uh, in 2021. And then I believe in speaking with uh, Mr. McConnell, he could also um, uh, inform uh, inform us further and just for, this, for council, but also for the community. I think it's really important that they know what's happening here. Did uh, you want to speak to that, Mr. McConnell? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Certainly. Uh, this certainly was a very busy year in active transportation uh, for our local, uh, uh, for the community. We did a number of uh, bike lanes throughout the community. I believe there was nine roads in total that were done as well as Bay Street. We are uh, actually work is beginning this week on putting a bridge over Central Creek to connect Cooper Street to uh, Dooley Avenue. Uh, with regards for work coming up, uh, next year, we, uh, as Mr. Elliott described in his report, the reconstruction of third line from uh, the, where the hospital entrance is now on third line all the way down to Black Road includes the construction of an off-road multi-use, uh, multi-purpose path. Uh, that's basically another a spoke on the hub trail, which will provide the connection from where the hub trail currently goes through the hospital property on third line, all the way down to Black Road. And Black Road as from third line all the way down to McNabb now uh, does have uh, dedicated bike lanes on both sides. So that that section on third line will be done next year. We're also looking at redoing Mark Street. Uh, Mark Street is part of the existing, the original hub trail. Uh, we don't know yet whether that will be uh, just painted lines on the road or an off-road path. Uh, we will sort that out as part of the engineering, but we acknowledge that it is, uh, there's a lot of driveways coming onto that street. And uh, also there's a fairly uh, low traffic volumes on that street. In order to prepare for items coming forward beyond next year, uh, what we're asking for is as part of this year, there's a supplemental budget request in from staff for a small amount of money to do some more preliminary design and cost estimates. Uh, we have noticed that active transportation and certainly most of the, uh, of the work that we did this year uh, was paid for, a large portion of it was paid for by provincial grants. We know that the Trans-Canada Trail people are working with the federal government to get more grants, and we want to be in a position to access that funding uh, next year when those grants become available, hence the request for supplemental funding. So this was a very busy year. We will be doing third line in Mark Street next year, uh, and we're also getting prepared to access funding beyond 2021. Uh, Councillor Helsinger, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm not sure if Mr. Elliott has anything to add, but I think you summarized it, Don. Oh, well, that's that's uh, that's a good summary. It it seems most of the bigger active transportation components end up being in uh, other capital projects or near other capital projects. Uh, there's always a, a that's usually where they end up. Bay Street, there's a lot of a lot of AT components on Bay Street, but it's in what looks like a road project. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions on the 2021 Capital Transportation Program? Councillor Gardy, then Councillor Hollingsworth. Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna raise it just to follow on what Councillor Hillsinger mentioned, and uh, every time active transportation comes up, I'm going to reiterate it around this table. Um, anything that can be done in the West End. Uh, we much appreciate it. Um, I know that there's bike lanes on Core Road now, which is great. Um, I know that we're going to be doing that path between Cooper and uh, uh, and um, Rui Avenue essentially. Um, but uh, I will, and whenever it comes up, I'm going to remind staff and my colleagues that um, we need active transportation in the west end of this community as well. Thanks very much. Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, to Mr. Elliott. Um, can you just comment on um, re reconstruction? Um, talking to um, your colleagues over at Public Works, um, Susan Hamilton Beach, we are talking about the aging infrastructure, yeah. the underground, underneath uh, roads that um, aging. When you put your list together of our priorities, um, I'm assuming you look at the aging infrastructure 
and that's point one. Point two, out of all the areas with aging infrastructure, what are your concerns if we don't basically start focusing on the underground portion? So the first question is, confirm please if you do look at the aging infrastructure and you come up with your priority list, and two, what are your concerns over the next three to five years if we don't focus on the drainage underground infrastructure? Mr. Mayor to Councillor Hollingsworth, we do consider the underground infrastructure as part of the scoring system. We have an asset management system for roads together with storm sewers and sanitary sewers, and everything is reviewed in the field or sometimes the desktop review based on videos and anecdotes from public works as well when they have serious problems with sanitary sewers. All of that blends together to a scoring system, and that's primarily where we get the list, especially for the local streets that we do. Bigger arteries, obviously the resurfacing component comes from if the structure is still good but the surface is gone, we need to find the money to put a new surface on it. Thankfully, we don't have to rebuild some of these five lane streets for a while. But yes, we do have a system that scores underground drainage, sanitary and storm in that mix. Okay, thank you. And what with regard to the underground, one last question. The material from my understanding have changed over the last obviously couple of decades. And it's my understanding that some of our underground infrastructure have materials that are less adequate and it's basically impacting even rethinking the newer streets. Can you just comment on the materials used? Mr. Mayor to Councillor Hollingsworth, yes, sanitary sewers are a good example. We still have clay tile sanitary sewers. It's a brittle material. Sometimes when public works crews are flushing, they get pieces of the pipe coming out when they flush. So, but granted a hundred year old pipe lasted that long, it's pretty good, but we're hoping to get 150 or 200 years out of the new plastic materials that we put in the ground. Okay, thank you. Any other councillors have questions or comments on this on the main motion? As amended, we can have a vote on the main motion as amended. All in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, so that brings us to 6.12, Councillor Christian, stop sign at Illinois Avenue. We're going to have the clerk read the, uh, is there a, a resolution with this, Madam Clerk? Yes. Not Councillor Christians, but like the, the actual... Yeah, I, I will read the, uh, the motion yeah. um, as it is in the report. Mm -hmm. It's a motion by Councillor Scott and Dufour resolves that the report of the Manager of Design and Transportation Engineering dated September 28, 2020, concerning a stop sign at the intersection of Illinois Avenue and Texas Avenue be received and that Council approve the recommendation to move the existing yield sign five metres closer to the edge of Texas Avenue to improve visibility of the sign. Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the uh, original resolution uh, was written into the staff report, we were, Councillor Hollingsworth and I were asking for a stop sign at that location. Um, I wanna thank staff for the report. I mean, it's, it's, it's to the point. And I also wanna thank Councillor Hollingsworth for her help, but um, I don't disagree with staff's assessment of the situation in terms of vehicular traffic, uh, vehicular collisions and the metrics that we use to determine whether a stop sign goes in or not. My reason for asking council to consider turning down staff recommendation and putting in a stop sign is purely for uh, child pedestrian safety in the area. Um, as most of you know, Holy Cross, <clears throat> excuse me, is a major Catholic elementary school in the area and there's lots of vehicular pedestrian traffic there. Many of the kids live in the northeast quadrant of that area. They live in the Bristol, uh, Sutton, Chartwell area. And many of them, upon entering and leaving school, 
travel on Texas Avenue. When they're leaving, they're heading north on Texas Avenue on the west side of the street because that's the only sidewalk. When they get to the end of the sidewalk in Texas, they have to cross the street and enter a catwalk to get into that northeast quadrant. And therein lies the problem. Um, and the problem gets even worse in the winter when you have snow banks and um, you know you have sight line issues. So we're, we're simply asking to add another level of safety for the children. This isn't about vehicle collisions. I understand why staff make this recommendation. I've only I've been on council for ten years. I think I've had three or four requests for stop signs and never one like this. So I don't think we're setting a dangerous precedent. Um, I know we want to remove signs, stop signs, but there's not heavy vehicular traffic. There's heavy pedestrian traffic, namely children. And there are other streets in the area that have st uh, stop signs like Parkdale Avenue, et cetera. So the cost to put up a stop sign here to add another, another level of safety for the children, I think is warranted. I'd rather be proactive than reactive when it comes to their safety. So I'm asking that council consider turn, turning down this recommendation of staff and then quickly voting on a resolution to put up a stop sign. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, do we have any questions or comments from council on this? Uh, council as well. I, I can just comment from experience as a parent whose children went to Holy Cross, and it is um, very congested, and as someone who drove her kids, um, definitely I think um, both vehicle traffic and the pedestrian traffic can be a little uh, difficult at times, and I support um, Councillor Christian's um, initiative, and I think it's, it's definitely necessary. So, Council, for my part, I'm just going to make a Councillor Shoemaker will comment after, I suppose. Councillor Shoemaker, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So, is is, um, is Council Christian seeking to amend the resolution? No, it's not an amendment, Council Shoemaker, because it's it's contrary to staff's report, right? So, like that, if you're not amending the motion because the motion is not to do like their their recommendation is not to do this. So, their recommendation is. Uh, to, to move the yield sign so it, it, it has better visibility. Uh, you know, traffic issues are significant issues and we take advice from like, you know, our, tra our professionals on that. So it's, he's not amending staff's recommendation. So what we're gonna vote on staff's recommendation. If staff's recommendation passes, it's over. If staff's recommendation fails, then Councilor Christian's gonna move that we di council direct staff to put a stop sign there. So you're voting on staff's recommendation. I mean, and that's to be on the record, right? So like it's clear what the advice test was and whether we took it or not. And to that point, for my part, council, I'm gonna support staff's recommendation. I, I, I don't agree with the, the uh, suggestion. This isn't a precedent. I think it is a precedent. I really don't think council can decide where stop signs go and don't go. I mean, we have the authority to do it if we choose to exercise that. <laughs> when it comes to matters of traffic, you know, we, we defer to professionals on that and we get their advice and recommendations. And uh, it's not staff's recommendation based on the standards that they apply and the, the rules that they follow to, to do this. So uh, I'll be supporting their, their recommendation. So if we could uh, have a vote on the motion then, if we can all in favor of the motion, and this is the staff motion, staff recommendation, all in favor? And opposed? Okay, so the staff recommendation, I think, fails, but I don't have the final numbers in front of me. I'm what, just what? waiting for Council, well, Council Christian, obviously, will vote, right? Okay. So that was four in favor and seven opposed. Okay. So the recommendation is defeated. Okay, so, so staff's recommendation is defeated. So Council Christian is then moving to have a stop sign installed at that intersection. Do you have wording for Council Christian's motion? I do. Okay, go ahead. I'm just, uh, if you could give me a minute to get it into the system, then I'll open it for a vote. Councilor Christian, do you have a seconder for your motion? Uh, I do not, but I certainly would welcome one. I think Councilor Shoemaker had his hand up there. I'm the ward person. 
Well, I don't care who seconds it. I just, I saw Councilor Shoemaker's hand there. So, makes no difference to me. Council instructs staff to install a stop sign at the corner of Illinois and Texas Avenues as soon as possible. And that is open for vote. So, yeah, I know. Before we vote on it, Council Nero has a question. Council Nero, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do I see any solicitor on that? Yeah. And just, just, so, just so we're clear, on the first resolution on Council's recommendation, it was to move the yield sign. Right, so it wasn't the yield sign's there. It exists to move the yield sign. So this resolution would be to take the yield sign out and replace it with a stop sign. So that's what we would be directing staff to do. So uh, do we have the city solicitor on on uh, the, the line? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Okay, go ahead, Councilor. Mr. Mayor, three hundred city solicitor. Where where do we stand in terms of liability when we make this type of decision? Do we take away? staff's position um, legally to defend this if, if something ever happens? Through you, Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, Nero, I'd have, to, I'd have to think about it. There's just too many unknowns about the question. I apologize. many times before um, and I was just wondering if we make the staff makes these decisions based on warrants based on criteria <clears throat> and something happens they're easy to defend that's right that's right because we could rely on the warrants and the criteria and, right. the, and the evidence that we get from the Ministry of Transportation on how to do these things and, and we're consistent in making those types of decisions and yeah. approvals from council for when we deviate from this then we're all over the place. And my concern is, uh, and I certainly understand the reasons for Councillor Christian asking for the stop sign. I understand that. But have to be, we should be in a position where we could defend these things should something happen. And I don't feel confident that should something happen, that we would be confident in defending that. So, so I'm going to vote against the stop sign. I don't know where that leaves us though after. Leads you with the yield sign. Leaving it where it is? Sure it is, yeah. Then they're not going to move it either. Nope, they're not going to move it either. We just told them not to move it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Gardy. Um, I'm going to address it to, to Mr. Elliott, through you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Elliott. I, I know that there's a plan coming forward through from traffic and engineering, I believe, talking about uh, referring to uh, reporting on excuse me, school zones and slowing down traffic in and around schools. Now, I can speak to Holy Cross specifically because it's my work there. And one of the one of the one of the school zones that we do indeed have is on Bennett Boulevard, right? Is there an opportunity in what in what is coming back to council hopefully soon in regards to these school zones that it could encompass uh, more of an area in and around the school that already has some plans around it for, for uh, notifying traffic to kind of slow down or is it simply looking at school zones that you know uh, that are unto themselves that have no kind of mitigating factors to kind of calm traffic and the like you can't Mr. Mayor to Councillor Gardy, I'm not certain. I think we're looking at all existing school zones, but to, as far as expanding it around uh, to other roads around schools, I'm not certain. I'd have to, I'd have to dig into that one with staff. Okay, because, because you know, and I'll speak to this um, just because I have experience. The times that that Mr. 
that, that caused the Christian expectancy are the times when there's increased traffic in and around the school, right? Because not just simply throughout the day what traffic is like throughout the day, but working at a larger elementary school or a high school, um, there are set, there are more and more students who transport their kids in and around those 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 buildings. So as go the students walking home, so does the traffic driving driving families to and from. So I I I get where Councillor Christian is coming from. Um, but I also hear what Councillor Nero is Nero saying. I mean, is, is this is this something that we could kind of kind of wait on with the, the answer to, which couldn't be answered from Mr. Nero's question to the legal. Um, Mr. Elliott said he could look into it a little further, potentially um, with Mr. Romeo, I guess, um, and we could revisit this a little bit a little bit later. Kind of like I got through you, to, I guess that's something. To well, I have thoughts on that, but I'll defer to the CEO. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Garvey, procedurally, you would have to put up a motion to yes, uh, sure. refer it back to town. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, right I'm prepared to do that. Well, the 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 the, the my concern with that, Councillor Garvey, is when you refer the matter back to staff on this specific intersection, we have their opinion on it, right? There's there's nothing else okay, they have. Oh, all right. right. But he asked the question that he couldn't get an answer to. I asked the question that I couldn't get an answer to. So what's the next step, if at all? Well, I think they're, they're, those are broader questions that, well, Councillor, yours was, Councillor Nero specifically relates to the legal liability of not listening to staff. Which is a pretty valid question. Well, yeah, which is, which is we, we've gotten an answer to that question before on these traffic issues. Uh, so if you want to, listen, if you want to move to defer this, you can move to defer. That's, as a councillor, you can put that motion forward. You need a seconder for it. Can I say but, something? Yeah, that would be good. Sure. Am I up? Yeah. Uh, back to uh, Councillor Nero's question and the subsequent comments that were made. Are we suggesting that we're in a greater liability position if we take down a yield sign and put up a stop sign? Uh, I, I don't think how, anybody how is that suggesting possible? that. How, how is that possible? We're adding another level of safety. So, so Councillor Nero didn't suggest that. No, I, he didn't Nero. suggest it. He asked a question. It was sort of implied that because we're not agreeing with staff, that we've opened ourselves up to liability. And I question that because usually when we go from a stop to a yield sign and not take staff recommendation, I could see the liability. But becoming more safe, I don't see how it's possible to be liable. Well, I think it's it Councillor Nero's question is a valid one. It's it's a broader legal question on what happens when council doesn't follow the prescribed Ministry of Transportation outlines and warrants for what signs to put up. There are prescribed regulations for what signs go where. Staff makes recommendations in accord with those prescribed regulations. And in this case, we're not following it. And Councillor Nero rightfully is asking, is there a potential liability to that? We didn't get a clear answer from the city solicitor, but I, it's not a matter of which sign is safer. It's a matter of which sign is the appropriate sign in a specific location based on the traffic in that location. I'm not in a position to say which, which sign is safer. I'm not a traffic expert. But I certainly, from my perspective, will always follow staff's advice when they're applying the regulations that are prescribed by the ministry. Well, with all due respect, I think they're clinical in this position. We're talking about children's safety. Thank you. Yeah, I assure you, Councilor Christian, children's safety is, is important to everybody who sits in this council, which is why we follow regulations and provisions for this. But there was no mention of child safety. It was only vehicular accidents. You I think it indicated that there were no vehicular So, So to Councilor Gardy, we're back to your point. Did you want to move to defer this? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to ask somebody to second it. Does anybody want to do it? Does anybody want to second Councilor Gardy's motion on the deferral of Councilor Christian's motion? Councilor Nero, is that a second or do you have a question? I have a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just clarification on why are we deferring it? So what's the purpose of the deferral, Councilor? Because I asked, I, asked Councilor, I asked Mr. Elliott if he had information about the, the, the report coming back to us 
about expanding the school zone in and around our community. And if the, if 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 it would come if that report will encompass this area in and around one of our larger elementary schools. So you want to defer the decision on this to when that report returns? That's what I want to do. All right. I'm just looking for somebody that thinks you want to do it too. Okay, so one second. Councillor Nero seconding that. Councillor Bruni, do you have a question on that? When is this report coming back? Uh, Mr. Mr. Elliott, when do you expect that report coming back on school zones? Mr. Mayor, I'd have to check, but I think Carl hopes to have it in quarter four of this year, so it should be soon. Okay, so the motion, the, this is a motion for deferral now. If this passes, then, then Councillor Christian's motion will be deferred until the report comes back on school zones. Okay, so we're on that motion now. So it would be status quo moving forward. There's, there's a yield sign there, yes. right? You know, there's no action that needs to be taken. It's already there. So that, that stays there until further action is taken. Right. So is there any uh, questions on the motion for deferral? Councilor Dufour. Uh, just a uh, new scrap one. I already voted no on the motion. So I canceled yeah, that. that. No, okay, the, the, the clerk will. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Uh, does anybody want to speak uh, against the motion to defer? <clears throat> Go ahead, Councillor Collinsworth. I just want to um, make a comment. Um, I understand the rules, I understand the regulations, I understand the purpose of deferral. But hypothetically, uh, we all have agreed tonight that this particular school, this particular area is busy. Some of the counselors on the table have said that um, their children went to this school. Some counselors have said they've worked at this school. Some counselors said that um, they are very familiar with the business of it. Hypothetically, and hypothetically, if we defer this, and hypothetically, if a child does get hit, um, which could unfortunately happen, especially if the days are getting shorter, the light is not as great, the natural daylight, um, if hypothetically, if a child is hit, then I personally still see us as the city responsible because we tonight in chamber talked about the safety. And I'm not a lawyer, and in all due respect to the legal system, but I think we are now exposing ourselves because we have talked about children and safety. And so, um, having said that, I just would really hope that we start listening to our constituents. And yes, NTO um, makes regulations, rules, suggestions, but they are there as recommendations. Um, then let's listen to our constituents, our families, our children. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on the motion to defer? All in favor of the deferral? Opposed to the deferral? Okay, the clerk will tell me where we're at with the deferral when she gets the... I'm waiting for Councillor Hilsinger and Councillor Christian. So Councillor Christian and Councillor Hilsinger, we don't have your votes yet. Uh, yeah. Against. Councillor Hilsinger? She has voted. Councillor Bezal Allen, did you vote? I'm showing you and Councillor Scott as not having voted. Councillor Scott? I'm against the deferral. I'm confused on how the voting would have worked on the on the e scribe because it still says for the stop yeah. sign. This is the postponement. Oh, I have okay, to click. So, it down. Oh, gotcha. So this is to postpone it. So yeah, I'm opposed to postponing. Okay. And Councilor Gasol. Result. So okay. Okay. To postpone. Can you just communicate for the record, Councilor Rosalind, what you? I'm, 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 I'm confused. Are you for or against uh, postponing the decision on this until that other report comes back? I'm opposed to the deferral. Okay. Yeah. So markers opposed to the deferral. Motion failed. Okay. So we're back on the main motion, which is Councilor Christian's motion to uh, put a stop sign at this intersection. Any other comments on that motion? Okay, so now we have the, the main motion in front of us. Can we get it up for everybody's e scribe? I'm just, um, it's trying to catch up to the postponement. Sorry. Okay, so you can vote. So the motion to place the stop sign 
is the motion that's open for vote at the moment. That's right. Okay, so all of you can, so we'll do this now. All in favor of the motion? Okay, opposed to the motion. Okay, so the motion carries. I believe, based on what I read on the screen, but the clerk will confirm when she gets everybody's votes. Sir. I believe Councillor Christian has lost connectivity, but I'm assuming he votes in the affirmative. You can assume that Councillor Christian voted in the affirmative on that, for sure. <laughs> so the motion carries eight to three. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So that brings us to... That brings us to 5.5, the downtown plaza update. Um, and there's also a report on regular, but um, Colin Berman, Principal Landscape Architect with Brooke McElroy, has been in the waiting room. So, Deputy Clerk, is Colin in, in admitted now? So, Colin, uh, first off, I want to thank you for your attendance, and secondly, I want to thank you even more so for your patience. Uh, we, you've been waiting a while to speak to us, and so, so thank you for that. We look forward to uh, the presentation, and uh, and uh, I'll I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, we have Colin Berman in front of us from Brooke McElroy. Uh, we're pleased to have him here today to provide council with the uh, conceptual design uh, for input from council, and we'll be starting our public consultations on the plaza design. Uh, we're excited about the project. And um, I will turn it over to Colin. I just wanted to note one thing before he starts in that uh, Colin uh, was actually uh, raised here in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, so he knows the community very well and uh, we're thrilled to have him uh, a part of this project. That's great. Welcome to council. Great, thank you, Tom. Hello, Mr. Mayor, council. I will share my screen. Yep, great. Great. So good evening, members of Council and Mr. Mayor. My name is Colin Berman, and I'm a principal and landscape architect with Brooke McElroy. As Tom mentioned, I'm also from the Sioux, and I'm proud to be a part of this project. I still have family in the city, so I care a great deal about this community. My firm, Brooke McElroy, is a multidisciplinary design practice that includes landscape architects, urban designers, architects, and Indigenous designers. We have a significant portfolio of Northern Ontario work as we have offices in Thunder Bay and Winnipeg, in addition to our Toronto studio. This project will be a transformational one for downtown Sault Ste. Marie, a plaza that will be a four season destination full of exciting activities. Our task as the designers for this new plaza is to work closely with the community, council and city staff to advance concepts that reflect a fresh and exciting energy building in downtown. The plaza design process will build on growing awareness in the community of the importance of activity-based destinations in the downtown, which began with the City of Sault Ste. Marie's 2016 downtown strategy. Let's begin by looking at the site and its context in downtown. The site is bounded by Queen Street, Bay Street, Brock Street, and Spring Street. It's approximately 0.77 hectares or 1.9 acres in size. The site sits at the heart of downtown, due north of City Hall and close to waterfront amenities. It's within easy walking distance to many arts, culture and recreation, recreation destinations in downtown. The site is well served by active transportation routes with the new Bay Street bike lane linking directly to the block and the waterfront hub trail close by. Notably, the site is in a block with little green space in the immediate area. This tells us that any new la soft landscape areas will be well received here. There's abundant parking close by to the site with large municipal lots immediately south and north of the plaza. There are hundreds of available public spots within a five minute walking radius of the site indicated by the red circle on this plan. Zooming into the block, we can see that the site is ringed by a variety of businesses. The city has recently purchased additional properties to provide better access to Bay Street, enlarge the site, and to house the relocated indoor market. The co-location of the plaza and the indoor market is an exciting development that will support each other. 
Finally, it's important to note that the site is not flat. There's a two meter elevation difference between Queen Street and Bay Street, which presents a challenge as the major elements in the square in the plaza need to be flat. You will see during the concept design portion of this presentation how we have addressed the grade change in a creative and constructive way. I'm going to quickly move through the next slides as I have a limited presentation time here with you tonight, but these are all available in the package that was circulated to you before the meeting. These slides are four case studies that have a similar size and elements to this downtown plaza. We use them as benchmarks for sizing and placement within the site. The four places are Prince Arthur's Landing in Thunder Bay, a project that our firm designed and led, which includes a skating rink and splash pad with a thin layer or a scrim of water. And lots and lots of seating around because this area has become wildly popular in the city. The second case study is Market Square in Guelph, located outside of their new city hall building. It also in includes a splash pad with a scrim of water that transforms into a skating rink with colored lighting displays. The plaza now also hosts community theater events in, in the actual splash pad. The next case study is Riverwalk Commons in Newmarket, which again includes a skating rink and a splash pad with a scrim of water, and a community stage and flexible gathering area. Finally, we'll look at Pat Bailey Square in Ajax, which has a skating rink and water feature along with a flexible gathering area. A size comparison with each of these case studies confirms that the site, that our site is about the right size. Looking specifically at the skating rink and splash pad, we can see that all of our, that our case study rinks fit comfortably on our site. Before our firm was involved in this project, city staff con conducted community engagement to develop ideas for what people wanted on the site. From this list, the skating rink splash pad and flexible event space emerged as the key elements for the square. This data also gave us a good idea of what events might occur in the plaza. Early work on the conceptual design included a staff workshop to refine the program and figure out where each element should be located on the site. It became clear during the workshop that there was an ideal arrangement for the plaza. The skating rink splash pad should be next to Queen Street and the gathering area should be next to the future market building. The result, after many months of design and revision, is the plan you see here tonight. Let's now look at our design ideas for the plaza. Our concept draws inspiration from the St. Mary's River Rapids, a significant geological feature that is intertwined with the city's history. Formed during the last ice age, as melting ice waters breached a land dam near Grocap, the rapids became a focal point for the region's first inhabitants, who called it Bawitagong, or Place of the Rapids. The area has been a gathering and harvesting place for people for centuries. Post-colonization, Sault Ste. Marie became an industrial center owing to the St. Mary's River, hydropower, and regional resources. Today, the rapids remain an important experience in the city, with ships passing, fish and water levels ebbing and flowing. Our concept celebrates the dynamic St. Mary, Mary's River rapids, using their form as inspiration for the plaza design with shapes, patterns, and storytelling within the space. The plaza concept can be divided into two main rooms. The upper room, fronting Queen Street, hosts the main activity generator, the skating rink splash pad. The rink is set back from Queen Street and ringed with seating, because this will become a very popular place. The associated support building will house public washrooms, a skate change room, mechanical equipment, and a Zamboni garage. To the west of the rink is the main north-south walkway, which links Queen Street to Bay Street through the site. The lower room is a flexible outdoor gathering place, anchored by a stage and LED screen, which will act as a beacon, drawing people down into the site from Queen Street. The gathering place is next to the future indoor market building to the east, allowing events to spill out into the square. Between the upper and lower rooms are a series of elements that allow for elevation change, but also support the key functions of the space. Accessible ramps bookend a cluster of stepped seats that look onto the stage and provide lots of seating on market days. 
Stitching the site together are a series of layers. The soft landscape layer will green the site, helping to soften large areas of hard surface paving. The hard landscape layer includes a signature paving pattern that will express the St. Mary's River Rapids theme. Activation elements will enliven the plaza throughout the year. Let's now take a closer look at each major element within the plaza. The splash pad will, like the example shown here, have a scrim of water that kids really, really enjoy playing in. There will be two water jet zones, one quiet area off to the side for toddlers and one larger series of jets for older children. Anchoring the splash pad and rink is a signature mound feature constructed from the local sandstone that is so characteristic of many buildings in the city. When I think of buildings I remember from growing up here, they are all ones that are built from that lovely warm mottled red and cream sandstone. The mound will be a water jet feature during the summer and will be an island to skate around in the winter. During the winter months, the splash pad transforms into a skating rink. At 750 square meters, it will be large enough to host a big crowd of skaters. The experience will be enriched by a dynamic lighting strategy that I'll explain later in the presentation. Here, we can see a winter evening of skating in the plaza looking south from Queen Street. A signature paving pattern will help to unite the plaza's rooms. The pattern will be inspired by the St. Mary's River Rapids. We will be developing this pattern during the next phase of design. Large steps between the upper and lower rooms are retaining walls, but also functional seating. Above those steps are a series of shade structures that will also reflect the Rapids theme through patterning and lighting. They will provide a nice cool spot for parents to sit while their children splash in the water. A fire pit at the top of the amphitheater steps and next to the skating rink will become an important gathering area in the plaza because people love hot fire on a cold day. Anchoring the lower room of the plaza is a stage with an integrated LED screen. This is where folks will gather to watch the next play Raptors playoffs run, or maybe even the Leafs, I can dream. <laughs> the stage will host community events and be a shade structure and seating area when not in use otherwise. Here we can see two event scenarios, a concert for about 2,500 people and an outdoor market. There will be a variety of seating around the plaza supporting all the major elements and events. In the lower room, a play zone with a climbing feature will provide a fun diversion for kids while parents pause outside of the market building. A series of planting beds across the plaza will soften the space. They also act as sponges soaking up stormwater when it rains. The outdoor market space at the south end of the site does triple duty. It is a safe pedestrian walkway into the site, a public parking area, and a potential new home for the outdoor Algoma Farmers Market. Lighting will play a very important role in this project. Our lighting designers have developed a layered strategy to light the plaza. The first layer is general, general illumination light, which is provided by pole mounted lights and facade lighting. This light ensures you can see where you're going at night and feel safe. The second layer of lighting is audience, audience engagement and consists of two elements. Theatrical lighting will illuminate the skating rink and stage area. Textures and color will create a majestic setting on the ice surface on long winter evenings. An interactive lighting layer on the shade structures and amphitheater steps will change based on how the plaza is used. As people move closer to the area, sensors will detect the proximity and alter the lighting effects. Almost, I've got another uh, couple slides I'm good here. When people, are far, when people are far away from the area, a calm water effect will gently light the steps. As people approach the steps, the lighting effect will intensify to look like the rushing water over the St. Mary's River Rapids. There are many variations of how this interactive lighting can work. And we will design the exact triggers and effects as the project progresses. The Skate Change and Mechanical Building, located on Queen Street, is a functional but beautiful building. The facade treatment, still in development, will take its inspiration again from the Rapids theme. Clear glazing on, on the Queen Street facade allows the passerby to see into the Skate Change area, drawing attention to the, on the street. The building will have five public washrooms, a Skate Change area, 
a staff office, mechanical equipment, and a Zamboni garage. This downtown plaza will be transformational for the city. It will be a place for activity and celebration and will become the go-to outdoor destination when, once complete. I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. So we have uh, uh, our, our designer here to answer questions and we also have uh, staff to answer questions. And uh, I think that this is something that we can all be excited about. And I, I, I understand Mr. Bear that w the purpose of today is to introduce the concept, but then we're gonna go through and do some more significant consultations with our community, including our First Nation partners and our Métis partners. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Okay. Okay, so we'll open it up to councillors, Councillor Vezel Allen. The, the way this is just, uh, Madam Clerk, the way this is showing, I just have a real hard time seeing uh, the remainder of our city councillors at home. So I'm just going to ask them. There we go. Okay, I can see you now. So, Councillor, uh, we'll start with Councillor Vezel Allen, and then we'll go with Councillor Bruni, and then Councillor Christian. Thank you to you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Colin, for the presentation and the concept. It's, it's really, really exciting. And uh, I also participated in the Downtown Association Board, and I know our downtown members are, are very excited about this project as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, concerning the public consultation, um, how are you going about uh, doing that in our virtual world, and are you going to be reaching out to um, collaborative partners um, in creating that public consultation? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Rezzo Allen. Uh, we are actually uh, launching um, online consultations with Brooke McElroy. So uh, this Thursday, in fact, we'll be having two online sessions uh, that people will be able to um, join in uh, on online platforms. As well on the city website, we, have, we will have all the information related to the plaza and the designs, allow people to complete a survey, um, also to send us emails, to call, uh, to send in any feedback they may have on the uh, plaza. As you mentioned, we are reaching out uh, to different groups as well, including the Downtown Association, to have uh, uh, meetings with them and get their feedback. And we'll be reaching out to other groups, uh, as the mayor mentioned as well, um, to get their feedback to finalize the design. Thank you. And then my only other question, um, probably for you, Colin, is just in terms of accessibility. Um, both uh, Councillor uh, Bruni and I are on the Accessibility Committee, and when I saw the paving um, stones, that comes to be a, a big point of contention with people that are in um, assistive devices for their mobility, whether it's a, a wheelchair or a walker, and they find a, a lot of difficulty with, with the pavers. So can you address that, please? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, accessibility will certainly be a top concern for us. Um, the plaza will be designed so that every area is accessible without steps. So all, all ramps will be at 5%. Uh, so they're below the Ontario Building Code requirement. So it's essentially just um, a ramped sidewalk or walkway. Uh, as to the paving material, we will be selecting uh, larger unit pavers to minimize the number of joints uh, between uh, unit paving elements. So we do address this uh, very concern in many municipalities that we work in, and we've had a good amount of success with being very careful about the paving uh, units that we select. Uh, I mentioned in the presentation that we're also considering uh, an innovative stormwater management strategy. In this strategy, we'll be directing as much stormwater as possible as we get into the grading approach into the planting beds, which will act as bioswales, which will uh, allow us to not have any permeable paving in the, unit pa in the plaza, which also can cause difficulties for people with mobility uh, considerations. Great, thank you so much. I have no other questions. Okay, so Councillor Bernie. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, and just to add uh, with Councillor Bezoel, I hope Nancy Scott is uh, involved in the planning stages uh, um, so she can probably provide you with some expert advice. Um, I'd like to get a visual on the stage area. Uh, Tom, you mentioned that 2,500 people would be uh, would fit in that area. So if you look at the pavilion, how many people can go into the pavilion? 
Just trying to get a visual here. The Roberta Bondar Pavilion. Oh, Roberta Bondar Pavilion. Yeah, so Tom, uh, Councilor Bruni, what's our capacity at the Roberta Bondar Pavilion? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni, I believe the uh, Bondar Pavilion has the capacity for 4,000 um, standing patrons in the uh, under the tent. Uh, and also in the blueprints, I don't see any retail shops um, in this complex. Will there be? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni, uh, we don't anticipate having uh, retail shops built as part of the pavilion. Certainly, the uh, the surrounding edge of the plaza provides an opportunity for um, um, retail or restaurant uh, abilities, and we're certainly hoping we'll see development around the plaza in the future. Um, previous council meeting, we also talked about the ability um, of having the modular retail units. So we do see that as a feature that can be brought to the plaza, depending on the event that's going on in the plaza at a particular time. So we'll have the cap capability for retailers to set up shop in the plaza, as well as market space um, under tents and things like that uh, on the plaza. Okay. And my last question regarding the outdoor uh, skating rink, how many people would be able to skate on that rink? Very comfortable. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I think that's a question I may refer to Colin. He'll probably be able to answer it uh, better than I. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so when we can all gather again in large groups, uh, whenever that will be, uh, we have benchmarked the, the case studies that we had shown. You'll see in the presentation that the skating rink that we're proposing for this plaza is about the same size as the Guelph uh, Market Square skating rink, which I skated on with my children and gone on a busy uh, winter's night. And you can easily fit 200, 300 people on it on a busy, busy winter's night. Uh, the Thunder Bay project that was uh, that we designed uh, is about 200 square meters larger than what we're proposing, and it could fit more people than that. And it, it's been so busy and successful in that city that they've had to sometimes control the number of people going on. Um, so it it will accommodate uh, a good number of people, and we think it'll it'll meet the demand. And in fact, it likely will exceed demand over time as I think this will become the kind of signature skating experience. Um, we're limited in terms of the size that we can make this skating rink because of the size of the site itself. We had played around with earlier options with having a larger skating rink. However, it was occupying too much space uh, in the site itself. So we scaled it down, but still within the range of the benchmarks that we looked at to be comfortable for a large group of people. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councilor Christian, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a I just have a comment or a, co a couple of comments. This is spectacular. Um, I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Berman and and uh, Mr. Vare for bringing this forward today. Um, this is such a great shot in the arm for the city. It's it's going to be a great source of pride. You know, not only is it going to be uh, an event area, it's also going to be a gathering place. Even when there's no programmed events, people are going to want to go there. There's going to be a vibrancy down there that I'm really, really looking forward to. I think this is going to be a great shot in the arm for the city and the downtown core. I encourage the retailers in the area to start thinking about promoting their businesses through this area. I mean, there's going to be more foot traffic downtown. There's going to be more opportunities for restaurants. Uh, Mr. Mary, I think you'll agree. Uh, last council, we had to deal with a lot of serious stuff. We had some tough decisions to make um, just to maintain what we have. And this is a real growth story. And I'm really, really excited about it. Thank you. Thanks. Certainly appreciate that positivity, Councillor Christian. Uh, notable all the positive comments we've received since this project was announced and certainly something that appears to be embraced by the community so that, that's great. Um, I don't have anybody else on a list here. Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, I echo everyone's comments. This is so positive. I can see people in the office building going there and having lunch, taking their bag lunch or just, you know, catching a few um, wonderful um, sunny days and so forth. 
Um, just a question for Mr. Baer. Um, I'm asking the question because I did receive two emails from constituents. Can you just remind everyone about um, the funding sources for this? And again, I feel this is positive. I feel that is going to be uh, definitely a highlight in our community for many years. But if you can just touch on funding sources and is there potentially impact on the levy? Yes, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth. Uh, when we originally presented to council, we uh, had a budget of $6.6 .6 million. And um, we have applied for funding through NOHFC and FEDNOR. Um, and we are hopeful that uh, we will receive positive word on those funding applications. In addition to that, uh, we were to undertake uh, some fundraising within our um, um, activities for the plaza. And so that would contribute to the uh, plaza, obviously, as well in the budget. Uh, what we'll be doing is going back um, to the community now to retain uh, input into the plaza's uh, design and uh, finalizing the design and then coming back to council uh, with the uh, final budget. Uh, again, certainly we're hopeful that we will be able to receive uh, external support for this project. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bear. Um, if I may ask just one more question. I like how you touched on the fundraising aspect. Um, so um, did I hear that someone has already potentially gave a donation? Or uh, if you're interested in, can you start um, the process? Can people that are interested in donating donate now? Is it financial? Um, and would there be a tax receipt? Can you just touch on that? because? There are many constituents that are interested in the fundraising aspect. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Hollingsworth, uh, we will actually be coming back to Council uh, with the fundraising uh, strategy when we come back with the budget. And at that time, we'll be able to open up the, uh, the receipt of donations for the uh, project and provide direction to people on how they can support the Plaza project. Okay, that's great. And um, thank you, Mr. Bear. Um, I do have one question for the designer. Um, um, we have been brought um, up to speed quite often by our wonderful city planner, John McConnell, being educated and us on making sure we use materials that are um, preventing graffiti um, and so forth. Can you comment on materials that you potentially may be using on um, keeping the fresh look keeping it um, fun and hopefully preventing graffiti. Um, again, I'm not trying to be negative, but um, we hate to have your design um, overshadowed by something else. Yes, thank you. And I could, could you just repeat, I missed one key P, the sound quality is a little bit um, muffled from the council chamber, it sounds like there. Um, but the you were asking about the materials in relation specifically to what, please? I, I think, it, can you hear me clearly, Colin? Yes. Councillor Hollingsworth is interested in understanding uh, what you could do, what you might do, or how you might design to deal with potential graffiti or to deter graffiti yes. or that type okay. of activity. Great, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that for you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's something that we're all, again, in public space design, is something that we're cognizant of through the entire design process. Uh, on vertical features like the shade structures or the building, for example, we will, be ensure, we will be sure to specify an anti-graffiti coating so that any graffiti that is put on the plaza uh, can be removed easily. Uh, on the surface materials or concrete materials, again, we can look to anti-graffiti coating. There are products on the market, uh, unit pavers in particular, that come with this product or an anti-graffiti coating uh, right from the factory manufacturer's condition, and then several other elements within the plaza that we can apply post-completion. Um, it's definitely a concern. I mean, we also will strive to select robust materials where that anti-graffiti coating can't be applied. So looking at dense uh, acetified woods, looking at metal and steel wherever possible, as opposed to softer, less durable materials. Uh, I hope that this project will be so wildly successful that there will be people in it most of the time, which will help mitigate some uh, <laughs> some vandalism concerns, certainly at least through the early parts of the evening. However, you know, we do understand that there's people out at all times of the day and that damage is, is a possibility. So it's something that we will keep in mind as we continue through uh, the design process. Okay. 
Thank you. That's good news. Again, um, I am the design is wonderful, and I'm glad that you're using your chairs. And again, thank you to Mr. Don McConnell for educating us on um, new materials out there that could prevent that. Um, questions about um, active transportation from Archie Pond. Um, bikes, um, are there going to be some bike stands? Um, potentially, can you see a repair station for bicycles like you see in other communities where they have screwdrivers, wrenches, and so forth hanging from uh, cords? So, like a, a bike station. Yes, thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely, we'll have a full suite of site furnishing elements for cyclists. Uh, lots and lots of bike racks. So we'll have probably likely a combination of single bike racks along the street frontages, as well as higher capacity racks strategically, strategically located in the plaza. And we will figure out where all those elements go as we progress through the design process. And where I, I, I do like the idea of installing a bike repair station. There are a lot of great products on the market now. They're relatively inexpensive and they serve a great benefit. Here, it makes a lot of sense. As I mentioned in the site analysis, we're right on the new Bay Street bike lane and very close to the hub trail. So it makes a lot of sense to have one of those elements here at this site. Okay, that's good to hear. And uh, actually one final question for Mr. Bear. Mr. Bear, um, Again, security is always our top priority. I'm assuming that as we move forward with this project, you're going to look into um, security, uh, potentially maybe cameras or any other security features. Um, you don't have to really answer this question in great detail, but uh, can you confirm that security is definitely a top priority in this as we design this um, wonderful plaza? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, uh, yes, we're working with the consultants and our team to uh, take take security into mind as we design and uh, maintain this plaza going forward. Okay, thank you. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Berman, um, or perhaps Mr. Bear, is the plaza being designed in such a way that if the opportunity came up for additional property acquisitions in the future, it could be incorporated into the design? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Shoemaker, um, I would say yes. Um, in terms of the way the uh, consulting team is looking at the uh, kind of, as they refer to them, the active and passive edges of the uh, plaza, I think there'll be opportunity should we be in a position to acquire more property. Uh, we would be able to integrate that into the design. Okay, thank you. Okay, any uh, Councilor Dufour? Just as a follow-up question to that, Mr. Mayor, for you to uh, Mr. Bear, uh, has it been considered in the design uh, the possibility that businesses to the uh, west of the plaza may be able to have patios in the rear of their buildings instead of the front of Queen Street and, and is that uh, edge that abuts their properties where Bigham Street currently is considered one of the active edges or passive edges for the plaza design? Through you, Mr. Mayor, do uh, Councillor Dufour, yes. And in fact, we have had some conversations with uh, the restaurants in one area that borders the plaza. And, uh, you know, they're already thinking about opportunities to have patios that back on to the plaza property or adjacent to the plaza property. Excellent. That's great news. Thank you very much for the great work and I uh, really appreciate the design. Councillor Gardy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, I, I've lived in Sault Ste. for the last uh, 44 years, and it's um, a book that I can recall is the most exciting thing that's ever happened downtown. If you don't have a, if you if, if you have a pulse in Sault Ste. Marie, you should be excited about this. Um, I know the the Steelback Center's time was was something that we were all excited about, and it's a it's an arena we should be proud of. The Bondar Pavilion is is a wonderful place right on the river's edge. But um, Councillor, I think it was Councillor Christian uh, touched on it. This is going to be a gathering place and it's going to be a place for our community to come together. So um, people of my, my late father's generation often speak uh, very glowingly of, of, of Queen Street back when they were young. Um, and, you know, everybody has wanted to get it back to 
whatever whatever that was. Um, I think this is the, the, the best shot that we have. I think everybody who, 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 who works and uh, owns property downtown or a business or a restaurant should be extremely excited about this. Um, a community once known um, as a gathering place uh, generations ago is going to create a space in its downtown that uh, not only reflects that uh, cultural heritage, but um, is going to serve that sort of very same purpose for the community and surrounding area. So um, great work so far, and I look forward to the rest of it. Thanks. Okay. So I see no other questions or comments. Uh, Colin, I think it's, oh, sorry, Councillor Hil Hilsinger, I see your hand there. Please go ahead. So do we have uh, Councillor? Very good. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, mute was a little uh, sticky um, or unmute, I guess. Um, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is like having a dream and it is a dream, like it's a dream. And then slowly but surely over time, it becomes this amazing, phenomenal reality. Like, I don't, if there, there needs to be more words than excitement. We have to come up with some more because it's better than excitement. It's just fantastic. To Mr. Berman, my question is, uh, some of us are very passionate about um, improving in our community. We have a we're really sorry lack of public art here. And I, I noticed the only, I think I noticed the, the you do have one um, uh, reference in your presentation to interactive public art features. I'm wondering if just briefly, if you could comment uh, more um, on what you envision um, as, as how we can uh, use this as a way to really build uh, um, the heritage and the culture around public art here. Yes, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, we are equally excited about this project. I'm chuffed because this is, as I mentioned, this is my hometown. And I think I, I know how transformational it is going to be for the city. So I'm equally as, as excited as you all are. So it's great to hear the positive comments coming out of this meeting. Um, about public art is, is absolutely a, a layer that we want to weave into the site. We envision early uh, one of those elements being the lighting itself. We're working with a, a fantastic lighting designer called Mulvey Benani, and part of a big part of their pra practice is working with visual artists. And we are really treating our relationship with them as a visual arts relationship. So we want that lighting, that interactive lighting element, to be one of the key features that you remember about the site. I think it's going to be a really amazing and majestic part of the winter experience. I mean, it's dark really early during the winter months. So when you go, most people go down there to skate after school or after work, that's going to be the experience that they'll have uh, of the site. Uh, additionally, there's some really great blank canvases of the adjacent businesses uh, up against the plaza. So to build on the graffiti murals that you've recently uh, been busy creating in downtown, there's some great new canvases fronting this plaza. And they could be interim solutions because, as Tom mentioned, we have had discussions with some of the adjacent business owners. There are there are also some great opportunities to create new, and I think we'll be thriving retail spaces, cafe, restaurant spaces that front onto the square, uh, as well. Any opportunities that come up to integrate a, a standalone kind of public art piece, we will certainly explore. Whether that takes advantage of the existing municipal public art procurement process, or whether that's something that we kind of custom tailor to the site. Uh, we can we can begin to think of. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Is that it, Councillor Hilsinger? Yes, that's everything. So do I have everybody there? Do I have everybody here? Uh, I'll just cl close this up by by recognizing Colin and his work. Colin, I think it's fantastic that we uh, have uh, a, an expat, Sue White, working on this project with us. I want to recognize staff uh, for the work they've done to date and council for supporting this. This stuff doesn't happen overnight. And this has been a project that has been a long time coming and a long time in the works. And frankly, I think it's timing is impeccable. I think our community really could use uh, not only a boost, but could see us looking forward and looking forward to positive things that we're going to do. And looking forward to making positive and substantial investments in our community to develop and grow the community that we want to want to grow. So 
I think this is a great start. Uh, we're going to get some feedback, good feedback, over the coming month from stakeholders and uh, community partners. And uh, hopefully we'll be back here with a final project and, and a path to funding uh, that we could all be proud of and approve and move forward with. So all in favor. Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you for your time tonight and we appreciate uh, your patience. Okay, that brings us, Madam Clerk, to the resolutions, I believe, the council resolutions. Um, actually, I have on that uh, debt management and capital budget policies, um, I had indicated that it was on consent. It was actually moved from consent into regular because of the presentation. So I will just do that one <coughs> quickly. Um, resolved that the report of the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer dated September 28, 2020 concerning new debt management policy and new capital budget and financing policy be received and the policies approved. All in favor? Motion is carried. Unanimous because I can catch up to that one later. That, that okay. appeared to me to be unanimous. Already? Yeah. Then we will go to agenda item 7.8.1 is uh, EDC board appointments. of a motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufour results that Chris Cooper and Robert Brewer be appointed to the board of directors of the Economic Development Corporation. Do you have any questions or comments on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion is carried. And under agenda item 8.1, a motion by Councillors Shoemaker and Hillsinger, whereas in February 2018, Council approved a rezoning for a new Pino's grocery store on Great Northern Road. And whereas as part of that rezoning approval, Council approved a traffic light to be installed at a to-be-constructed entrance to Pino's adjacent to the Walmart laneway just north of Superior Home Bakery. And whereas businesses in the immediate vicinity of the proposed intersection were concerned about the ability of their clients and customers to get in and out of their premises, and whereas a potential solution to the access issue for those businesses would be for Walmart to grant them access to their laneway that will be controlled by a traffic signal. And whereas construction has begun on the installation of the traffic signals, but agreements have not yet been reached between businesses that abut Walmart's laneway and Walmart's access to the Walmart laneway, and Walmart has been difficult to communicate with on the issue, ignoring various outreaches and correspondence, now, therefore, be it resolved that Council direct that installation of traffic signals at the new intersection be paused until such time as agreements are reached or progress has been made on negotiations of such agreements between neighboring businesses and Walmart for access to their laneway. Further, be it resolved that staff continue to make efforts to reach out to Walmart to facilitate the negotiations for said access, as we've been attempting to do for quite some time. Councilor Shoemaker, did you want to speak to this? Yes. And I understand some progress might have been made. If that's the case, it would be good to hear about that. Yes, uh, that's to some degree. That's what I was going to provide an update on, Mr. Mayor. After my last, um, uh, after the last council meeting, when I put this on as notice of motion, through uh, acquaintances and friends, uh, I was able to connect with a, a gentleman who works at Walmart in their real estate department. Um, and through those conversations, uh, they have come to the table. They have agreed to uh, negotiate with the parties, being mainly being Superior Bakery, uh, but also uh, the development across the road at Pinos and the city, of course, who, who is, uh, plays an integral role in this. So they are uh, very much so at the table at this point. Uh, and, at, you know, I, I think the given the progress that has been made, I'm looking just to defer this motion for a couple of weeks in hopes that in that intervening period, we'll have uh, even more good news to uh, report. And, and I think that they, they seemed very open in my um, uh, communications with them uh, late last week to sitting down and, and hashing out a, a resolution to the issue. And I don't know, I had asked uh, Mr. McConnell and Mr. White to 
connect with them. I don't know if they have anything further to report on on communications they've had since uh, since I think I sent them an email Friday morning. See you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll just see if Mr. McConnell is available. Uh, there he is. Uh, he can. Uh, he gave me an update, but uh, he can give an update uh, as he attended the meeting on Friday. Um, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, Carl Ramil, our manager of traffic, uh, one of our engineers and myself, did meet with Mr. Fada on site on Friday. Uh, we are, I think everybody's in agreement in what should be done, and engineering is preparing a drawing that we're going to review with Mr. Fada as well as one of the other uh, businesses in the area prior to sending it to Walmart. Uh, I also have been in contact with the local store manager who has been very cooperative. So uh, I think everyone's feeling uh, rather positive about this at the moment. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's keep the progress going while the iron's hot, as they say. Um, and uh, I, I guess uh, procedurally, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to defer this for a few weeks. Yeah. I think your seconder would consent to that. I understand she does. Definitely. So. Yes. Okay. So we see no issue on council with uh, deferring this until, yeah. So we'll defer this until our next meeting and we'll get an update at that time. Okay. Madam Clerk, if we can move on to 8.2 then, please. A motion by Councillor Shoemaker and Nero, whereas it is in the City of Sault Ste. Marie's interest to see assessment growth across all sectors, and whereas community improvement programs have been successful in spurring assessment growth in targeted sectors and areas, and whereas community improvement programs must be vetted and approved by the provincial government. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Planning Department query the provincial government on their opinion on adding any and all commercial assessment growth as an eligible category under the city's existing economic growth CIP. Further, that staff make a recommendation on whether to implement such a community improvement program. Council Shoemaker, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, just briefly, Mr. Mayor, this is a, sort of a companion uh, motion to the next one that we're going to debate. Um, generally speaking, these CIPs are, are very well received. They work. Uh, and if we want to see commercial growth in our community, uh, as a way to, you know, increase uh, the expansion of existing businesses or or the development of new businesses. I, I think, you know, the broader the CIP uh, is, at least this would be my opinion, the broader the CIP is, uh, the, the more effective it would be. And so I'm, I'm asking staff to look into whether or not we can add general commercial assessment growth to our existing economic development CIP and whether it would... Uh, uh, whether the provincial government would approve that uh, rec that uh, request. Okay. Any comments, questions in that motion? See none. All in favor? Motion's carried. Councillor Christian, are you in the affirmative? He was. He's on mute, but he's in the affirmative. Yes, I'm in favor. I had my hand up. And under agenda item 8.3, a motion by councillors Shoemaker and Dufour, whereas it is in the city of Sault Ste. Marie's interest to see assessment growth across all sectors, and whereas there are documented areas of assessment decline or stagnation across the city, evidencing lower property values across specific pockets or neighborhoods in the city, and whereas staff Staff has developed mapping of areas of assessment decline or stagnation. And whereas community improvement programs have been successful in spurring assessment growth in targeted sectors and areas. And whereas community improvement programs must be vetted and approved by the provincial government. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the planning department query the provincial government on their opinion on adding a community improvement program for vacant buildings in areas of assessment declining or stagnation that undergo renovations to make them habitable, habitable again, with a minimum threshold on amounts spent on the improvements based on the maps already developed by the planning department, which shall be made public as part of the report to council requested herein, and further that staff make a recommendation on whether to implement such a community improvement program. Council Shoemaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this uh, was developed uh, substantially uh, with, with the input of um, Councillor Dufour as well, uh, and stems, you know, out of out of 
the the general uh, the, or uh, the general thrust that councils had to seeing uh, vacant and abandoned and dilapidated buildings either dealt with in one way or another. So either removed uh, or improved. Uh, and I think that uh, this is one way we can entice the improvement of those buildings, see if it works. Uh, and if it doesn't, then I think we, we you know, proceed down the road of attempting to have those buildings removed. Uh, so um, obviously, uh, that needs to opine on whether or not we can we can add this uh, CIP uh, to the to uh, the, if the province will allow us to add a CIP of this nature, but uh, I think it's worth looking at. Okay. Councilor Dufour, you want to speak to this too? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in, addition, in addition to what uh, Councilor Schumacher said, I, I just wanted to uh, point out that the, uh, the maps that were produced by the planning department uh, have been just a tremendously valuable resource. Uh, they were produced with input from our local GIS system, and they've been used already to leverage uh, significant funding from the provincial government for our, our uh, local home ownership pilot at, uh, at the BSAM. So I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps uh, some of this info can be leveraged for uh, further investment in Sault Ste. Marie and in uh, areas that uh, are in uh, dire need of it. So I hope uh, uh, the support of the folks around the table. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any comments, questions on the motion? All in favor? Motion is carried. And agenda item 8.4, motion by Councillors Gardy and Fezzel Allen, whereas for centuries the Great Lakes, its fresh water and the bounties it has provided have been a precious resource for the Indigenous people of this area, and whereas the banks of the St. Mary's River have been a meeting place for Indigenous peoples for centuries, and whereas the Great Lakes are the world's most vast and well-known bodies of fresh water, and whereas Sault Ste. Marie is situated on the St. Mary's River at the heart of the Great Lakes between Lake Huron and Lake Superior, and whereas fresh water and these Great Lakes have been so historically significant to the city and surrounding area. And whereas Sault Ste. Marie has a proven track record for providing world-class study and research through centres and institutes, including the Ontario Forest Research Institute, the Great Lakes Canada Research Centre, and the Invasive Species Centre. And whereas Her Excellency the Right Honourable Julie Payette, Governor General of Canada, on behalf of the federal government, announced the establishment of a new Canada Water Agency during the speech from the throne Wednesday, September 23, 2020. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mayor Provenzano communicate with both Chiefs of Batchewana First Nation and Garden River First Nation about pursuing this opportunity for our area and working together to showcase our unique history and environment to the federal government. Further, be it resolved that Mayor Provenzano, on behalf of City Council and the citizens of Sault Ste. Marie, pen a letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Jonathan Wilkinson, and Member of Parliament Terry Sheehan, expressing interest in establishing the new Canada Water Agency here in Sault Ste. Marie, outlining the unique aspects of our community and surrounding area, which make us an excellent location for this agency. Councillor Gardy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, 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 the motion is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. I heard about it in 2019. Obviously, some plans of the government got sidetracked over the course of the last several months. Um, when, when I heard the Governor General in the speech from the throne announce uh, the establishment of an agency that would uh, manage and preserve Canada's water, I thought of no better place than, than through St. Marie. Um, I challenge anybody anywhere in the country to, uh, let, to tell us that uh, we aren't as deserving for many reasons as any other place in, in the country to establish such an agency. Uh, we touched on it uh, this evening and I think couple of times about uh, indigenous, uh, the indigenous peoples of our, of our past um, and present, but specifically for the for centuries they gathered uh, as rapids as, um, the St. Mary's River. Um, the federal government has noted that this is a territorial and uh, a joint venture um, water management and preservation in the, in the country right now between you know, provincial, federal, territorial and First Nations partners. We, we know the, the struggles that many um, First Nations communities in uh, our uh, part of the country 
and others have had with fresh water. Um, we've established ourselves as a leader in working with neighboring communities, uh, Bajuan and Garden River. Um, there are more and more reasons, and I could go on forever, and I only want for a couple more seconds, but, you know, we live on the shores of the St. Mary's River. We live in the middle of the Great Lakes. We are surrounded by hundreds, literally, um, inland lakes um, in and around Sault Ste. Marie. Um, I think, um, you know, it might be a long shot, but long shots often um, don't make sense. This makes sense. And if you, if you think it's a decent idea, and I've had a number of people contact me to say that they think it is, especially considering our universities and our other research institutions as referenced in the motion are located here. Um, if you think it's a good, good idea, send uh, Terry Sheehan, our member of Parliament, a Facebook message. Tweet him. Call him at his office. Call his number at Parliament Hill because um, I think we're deserving of a, of a water agency. Some people think, you know, the plans are already made, but plans can change. And I don't think any other community has expressed direct interest in this opportunity. So I think um, we should. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gardy. I'm not sure that anybody would be able to put that better than you just did. Uh, so I'll just agree with everything you said. Uh, does, does anybody else have any comments, questions on that? And uh, we'll get working on this right away, Councillor Gardy, because I expect it's going to get. Did you have a comment or question, Councillor Bezalel? Just a very uh, quick comment. And this really, I think, is a, our first step toward really supporting that declaration of mutual commitment and friendship that we do with the municipalities and the IFC. And I'm uh, proud to support this with uh, Councillor Gardy. And yes, the stronger our voices are collaboratively and together, then uh, we can create some change. So I, uh, I'm not going to call uh, Terry Sheen right now, but I'll send him an email. Perfect. When we're done. Okay. Yeah, so, so I think we'll get unanimous unanimous agreement on this motion. Uh, good work on it, Councillor Gardy. You, it's not a good idea. It's a great idea. All in favor? Motion is carried. Does that bring us to bylaws, Madam Clerk? Before we get into bylaws, I just wanted to take a minute. I meant to do this at the beginning of the meeting, and then we got into the meeting. I just wanted to, if for whoever might still be watching, if they can kind of spread this message to their family and friends. I think Ontario reported 700 cases today of COVID-19, and we've seen a trend where there's an increase on Mondays, and that might be a result of a lag. But in any event, whether that's the case or not, 700 cases reported in a day is a significant amount. Uh, so I, I, I believe that rightfully, naturally, and understandably, a lot of people in the community are fatigued by this. It's been difficult to stay committed to the public health uh, guidelines and instructions. It's been difficult to keep our kind of social circles tight and to not engage in some of the activities that we naturally want to get back to and engage in. That's all very understandable. Uh, you know, confusing to bring your child to school or see kids going to high school or see kids going to college, university, but then still restricting your own interactions and your family's interactions at other times. I think it's really clear from the numbers that it's critically important that as a community, we recommit to Ogoma Public Health Device, that we make sure when we are inside public spaces or private spaces with people that aren't in our social circles, that we wear non-medical masks, that we minimize our social interactions to uh, the smallest group of people that we reasonably can uh, in accord with the public health advice, that we wash our hands frequently, uh, that we make sure that we keep track of our contacts so that if we do test positive for COVID-19, we could contact other people that we've been in touch with. And critically, that if we don't feel well, we don't go to work. And if our children feel well, we don't bring them to school. Uh, the last thing that we want to see is is to, to go back to a state where we're locked down and we're all at home. Uh, but if the numbers keep on climbing, uh, there'll be have to be decisions that are made. Uh, and I don't. I'm hopeful that we can keep the numbers here low, so that the decisions are made elsewhere to do those things. That we can have a case that we don't have to do those things here. Uh, but that's yet to be seen. So we have to really, I think, as a community, focus on the task at hand 
And although we have been in this for seven months, we have to focus on what Algoma Public Health is asking us to do. I think Algoma Public Health has given us good advice to date and has helped us stay safe to date, uh, but we have to continue. Uh, we still have no, uh, uh, the, uh, no, the, 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 uh, Vaccines. We still have no vaccine for the virus. The virus, the pandemic is growing, it's not shrinking. It's a very serious virus and we need to keep each other safe by following Global Public Health advice. And Councilor Gardy was one of the first people to say this to me uh, and he's, a, as we all know, he's a vice principal. The, the, the best ways to keep the virus out of our schools, uh, whether it's our elementary schools or our high schools or our colleges or our universities, to keep the virus out of our community. The best way to keep the virus out of our retirement homes and, our, and, our, and, our, and, and keep it away from our seniors is to keep the virus out of our community. So let's, let's all be patient with each other uh, and be kind to each other, but let's all focus on recommitting to Algoma Public Health advice and doing what we need to do to keep our community safe. Madam Clerk, if you can go on to the bylaws, please. I have a motion by Councillors Scott and Bezalo Allen, resolved that all bylaws under item 11 of the agenda under date September 28, 2020 be approved. All in favour? Carried. And then I have a motion by Councillors Gardy and Bezel Allen, resolved that this council proceed into closed session to discuss one matter concerning labour relations or employee negotiations. Further be it resolved that should the said closed session be adjourned, the council may reconvene in closed session to continue to discuss the same matter without the need for further authorizing resolution. All in favour? Carried. And a motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufer that this council now adjourn. All in favour? Carried. Uh, Rachel, is it Corey? Is Corey the acting mayor? Yep. You got to do clothes for me. Oh.